super gray yeah. area because people, I mean, we've all probably seen and they're better now about it, but I mean, I used to drive past where, you know, the combine was loading in the truck and there's 600 pounds of corn still, still happens, still like, happens. right there. And you're like yeah. looking around like, <laughs> <laughs> looking for a tree stand, yeah. like dying on you. Yeah. Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Deer Grow. Man, it's almost food plot season, Jared, and Deer Grow is one of those products that has really changed the way that we plant food plots and the success we've seen from them. No doubt. I've been, you know, trying to plant food plots my, my entire you know, whitetail hunting career, which is a little shorter than yours, but the minute that I started or that I, you know, I realized that I could get Deer Grow back into some of these remote plots where I couldn't get lime or fertilizer, especially in the 50 pound bag, you know, format, mm -hmm. so everything was changed. You know, I could get into these spots uh, moving forward with a, with a backpack spray and that's since escalated to these 40 or 60 uh, gallon sprayers and we're doing upwards of you know five to ten acre food plots just with your grow and having phenomenal success yeah and i mean with the price of fertilizer lime diesel everything this year i mean what better way to get in there and grow a successful food plot at about a third of the cost check out deer grow at deergrow.com <laughs> hey we're back hey on our podcast episode 125 nick how y'all doing one, two, five. One, yeah. two, five. Seems like that's a lot. That's a lot of podcast. It's a lot. 120. When you put it in all? terms of consecutive weeks, you realize that it is a lot. Say, we never missed a week. Say in, on average, two years. what, like two hours of podcast? So that's 250 hours of podcasting. It's a lot. It's a lot of time. A lot of hours are spent at this table. It's pretty cool to think about it that way. It is. Mm hmm. Yeah, the growth, the molding into men that's happened here. <laughs> Look at Nick. He's practically yeah. a different person. <laughs> That's in really a, only, but it's crazy. That's really only like when did you join 10 us, straight then? days of podcasting. Uh, what number? March. No, what number? Oh, uh, 78. Wow. Okay. So yeah. approaching like the halfway mark. You've been here maybe 40% of the time. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. Wow. June 1st will be a year. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, pretty cool. Crazy. Well, it is April 27th. If I can see it through my sunburn. We just talked about, was it last podcast that we were like, Nick, you and I need some sun, man. Yeah. We're like, what? Yeah, I got, I got my Northern tan, which is red. Yeah. Jeremy got sun burn. I got moon burn. <laughs> <laughs> You're kidding when you say that, right? That's not a real thing. <laughs> no, okay. uh, it's just a joke of how like pale I am. Mm. Oh, okay. You know, moon like, burn. like a vampire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I gotcha. Yeah. You, Nick, you got a little bit of ginger in you, don't you, Nick? I do. My, Touch. My facial hair is ginger. Did you shave? Uh, so glad you didn't say your Probably, pubic hair. Oh, fire bush, huh? He's like, oh, yeah. well, I mean, now that you ask. <laughs> it's all the same, right? Yeah, all the same. All, all the right. same. That's good. Uh, but I got some because I was planting. Got some corn in the ground. Uh, did a did a binge. Got home at like 1 a.m. last night. That's are fun, dude. You just t tune out and get it done. Just yeah, go, man. Tractor therapy. Yeah, use the, uh, I did put, um, I did do like a, I don't know. It's going to be five to seven minute review on that Tar River that I'm going to put out. Because I had enough people ask me about it that I was like, I'm just going to do like a review. So I like I show some of the mods. And I mean, it worked really well in farm ground. Like if, if you have previously worked food plots or you're in crop country, I think it'll work fine. You, you still need to do some modifications. The pasture, like raw pasture stuff was was tough. I mean, I still think it's going to, it'll do all right. But I mean, it didn't. I don't. I don't think there's a machine out there that does that. I can't even take a disc and turn over just raw pasture. Yeah, I mean it's just you have, to, you have to either burn it off or mm -hmm. or completely torch it with glai. Well, and that's what our guest, who's a farmer, because we're not. It's Eric Hansen. Uh, it's Eric. Eric's back Eric's on. Eric's, yeah, <laughs> uh, we were talking, and he's like, you know, I got the corn in earlier. It, hypothetically, if I get like a fail on one of those fields in Kentucky, I might even just go in and turn it and then run that as like a normal grain drill through it to get like better seed depth and stuff. Basically, double crop of corn on it. I would, still have enough. What time. do you mean? Just run it as a grain drill. You wouldn't actually change anything. You just mean you'd till it and then. Yep. Yeah. So it just would be softer going through. Yep. To get better seed depth on it. Gotcha. And coverage. Gotcha. So I'd be curious to hear. You know, I'm sure Eric's got a lot more experience with weed control than we do. That's one of the primary motivators for us looking at like a no-till drill, or even me just like mm -hmm. you know when I put clover pots in this year, I did nine of them. You know, almost four or five yep. acres, and nuked I didn't. It. I didn't touch the soil. Yeah, I just nuked. I it. nuked it. I put seed down. You know, more than mm -hmm. they're calling for because my. Have drip, you seen those yet? Are they coming up? I haven't been back. Mm -hmm. I haven't been back. Uh, sure well, I've seen, I've seen some from a distance. I didn't go and look close. Uh, and I can see that they're burning down. So my, my glide took. Yeah. Oh, least. yeah. That was, and that I was going to say, that was critical. I think it's probably critical with whether you're disc in or no-tilling or whatever. Like, 
my I, I use that simazine and gly combo and i mean it nuked it and i mean that that's a critical piece of planning a successful food plot <laughs> you, you wear like a uh a covid mask when you're putting uh gly out no Dude, but we're both gonna die of cancer like i, I would not <laughs> be surprised Oh no! I basically drink that stuff. Yeah, I definitely, I've definitely <laughs> taken a face full. It's like when I turn into the wind. I'm like, oh, oh yeah, what? that does. I know. Yeah, they like, they like, shouldn't your eyes burn? I'm like, I don't know. I can't see anyway. Yeah. Oh, it's funny. Like now when I'm in farm country, I'm like, smells like glyphosate. It smells like gly out here. Yeah. No, I don't do that. I don't wear gloves. <laughs> like I, I just like mix chemicals and stuff, and I sit in there eating my chicken bacon ranch. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. Tangy, tangy. <laughs> could, uh, could be why my belly's a little upset today. So. Oh, boy. We got yeah. to be more careful with that. Well, I mean, do people do that? Well, ask Eric. He's a farmer. Like, we're not farmers. I, dude, we're I can animals. remember when I was There's like... There's no way, dude. There's no way that... I mean, I know around the whole Monsanto's bad, cancer, da-da-da. But, dude, there's no way that people are, like, spraying gly one time a year and, like, getting cancer from well it. see i can remember when i was a teenager spraying like weed i would have like or weeds oh weed <laughs> whatever uh whatever it is well, it's, weeds mom weeds <laughs> what is that uh dandelions uh what? no like the, the real uh gnarly plants that just grow up in the pastures the uh like the horse like nettle and stuff a thorn or something whatever know. whatever it is big yeah. big you know big big weeds yep uh, I'd be out there like with in like ball shorts and a t-shirt basically like mm -hmm. on a four-wheeler and it's just like all over my legs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I'd like come home, my dogs are like at me, they just like fall over. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> they'll be all right. <laughs> they'll be like, my skin, like my skin never burns. Like I've got open wounds yeah, mine, just like I sucking never felt it that. Yeah. <laughs> the open wounds. I think, I, I think like plants, I just become glyphosate resistant. Yeah, is, right. Is what happens. You're a GMO guy. Yeah, <laughs> GMO at this point. <laughs> Would that be your superhero power if you could choose? I'm GMO guy. <laughs> yeah, I just drink, or, you know, gly. I just pee and it just kills stuff. Uh, yeah. So. That would be handy, I suppose. I'm sure Eric is just shaking his head at this point. He's like, he's like, this yeah, he's is like, you don't want to get near that stuff. Yeah, he's like, you shouldn't do that. That's mm. not good. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's so why the got, podcast is so entertaining. Yeah, I got uh, got some corn in. Um, we'll keep everybody kind of up to date on how that progresses here. We got a big rain coming through, so that uh, should settle that seed down. And, and we've had some good rain. We've had some good rain. Yeah, Ohio was great. That soil was, looked awesome. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty stoked. I mean, it's at least a step forward. I also did um, – I'm going to probably give Nick a drone, a bunch of drone clips. We'll just do, like, an Instagram story or YouTube story Nick or something. Nick was excited there for a yeah. minute. I thought he was getting a drone. No, no, no. No, <laughs> no you're not. Don't touch my drone. And for you, a new <laughs> drone Dropbox full Edited. picture. He just so. got a new computer. Yeah. We can't yeah. – I mean yeah, – yeah. That he's not using today. He's still using mine. Yeah, so, I mean, if anybody sees that the, uh, the podcast is up late ever – Blame Nick. It's not mm. the it's not the equipment anymore. It's not, no, no, it's not the equipment. <laughs> but uh, I'm gonna try. I, you could see some of the the screening that I did, you know, or have set up to kind of access some of the new farm stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean, successful two days of planning and exciting. Yeah, it feels like that's it's one common, thing. Dude, there's another. There's that's the best thing about deer season. There's another there's one another on the horizon. One yeah. yeah. So, dude, you know, one thing I like to do this time of year, and, and I guess occasionally throughout the year, is go back into my photo roll on my picture. And if I want to be like encouraged, or like mm -hmm. I like to look back at to this day see, last year, see what you got. and I'm like, oh, yeah, look, you know, that's when what, we first saw this buck coming mm -hmm. up with nubs, mm -hmm. or, you know, that's when we, I got, you know, mm -hmm. got our beans in or whatever. I'm seeing some decent stuff. Fun velvet. to see year to year. I sent you a picture of oh, shit. That was yeah. like last week. Buck had brow tines yeah. and stuff cranking already. Like that. There's so many misconceptions about that. I got guys, oh, yeah. I got guys sending me pictures and they're like, I mean, you know, great guy. I mean, it's nothing to their character, but they're like, uh, oh, look at this deer. Like, he's so far along. Like, I bet he's going to be a huge one. I'm like, it no. has nothing to do with that. No, like, probably not. Now, if he's got bases that look like, you know, baseball bats, yes. Good sign. Good chance. Good sign. Um, I see. also saw a lot of people having bucks holding, like, in April. Really? Not a good sign. Eh, it happens. Yeah, you won't see that unless they turn out to be like this deer. Yeah, which is possible, but yeah. rare. My mount should be down here pretty soon. Mm, I got new two, one. I got two with Trav. Yeah, yeah. I was the same years are. Well, I dropped yours off later in the year, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I don't know where those are at, but pretty cool. Um, anything else we want to talk about before we bring in Eric? No, let's get rolling. All right, bring him in. 
cool. There you go. Got it. I got yeah. the lawn. I have the lawnmowers running outside, but that'll be temporary. Ah, uh, so. you'll be fine. How how uh, we couldn't see your facial reactions? Any cringing to that that pre podcast introduction? <laughs> what, what, what can we do to undo the damage that's undoubtedly be done been done? Um, so I'll tell you a funny story. It may it might make you feel better actually. When my dad and grandfather, when they used to spray with uh, airplanes, they would. They would go. They would send the young people out and stand where the plane needed to go on the next pass, and basically like hold up their hands, and then the chemical would come in and basically land on them, and then they'd go to the next one and keep no going. No way. Down the They're just dousing them with glyph from an airplane. Yeah. Well, I don't think they had glyphosate back then, but they probably actually was worse to be honest with yeah. you. So it's called Agent Orange. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not suggesting that you don't be careful, but just straight asbestos. Like, <laughs> I just had my kids stand out there, and I'm just wanding them with glyphosate. <laughs> Harlan, stand here. Do not move. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like Chris Farley, you know, with the gasoline. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty. So okay, so you know, we'll be all right. So far, so good, dude. Are are you uh, are you a farmer who uses uh, chemicals then? Yes. 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 We are. Uh, we are not organic. Correct. Um, so we use chemicals. Yes. Is there any such thing as true organic farming, Eric? Man, you guys really want the. Sorry, we're going right for it. Yeah, we're not farmers. Um, I mean, it depends what your definition of organic is. I think that mm-hmm. to answer that one. I mm-hmm. mean, I think there's standards out there, and I think they vary, they might even vary a little bit state to state. I'm not totally sure on that, yeah. but I mean. Yeah, seems I mean, like if you're in, if you're in the same atmosphere that's exposed to like the chemicals, like inevitably, right? It's gonna right. it's gonna transfer I mean, at some point. Exposed. I mean, you're gonna you know if you go through life, you can worry about anything you want. You know what I mean? If you choose to worry about that stuff, well, I guess more power to you. But personally, I just yeah, be careful. Don't use them any more than you need to. But I don't stress out over being exposed to them or anything like that. So. Agree. I'm not stressed. <laughs> Although maybe just avoid getting it on your hands and eating sandwiches. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I definitely yeah, try to be careful. It's the breathing it in. It's the breathing it in that I I've, I've thought about it. Like you know, when I'm out there on a ranger and I'm like I'm turning into the wind and I feel that I feel it across <laughs> my face. I'm like, that's probably not good. Yeah, just hold your breath. I, I, I'll hold my t-shirt up from time. Yeah, I'll tell you what. The other one, dude, is when we're. Uh, Got to watch those windy days. Wow, well, listen, I got to be careful hot. with this too. So like, I, you know, you always hear about birds and like you know how their crap is like uh potentially harmful and stuff no is you that know? true yeah like chicken oh like chicken litter, litter and stuff? And yeah, yeah, yeah like you don't want to breathe that I stuff in. i thought you meant like a robin so down, shitting on you down at the dairy mart we have like a flock of pigeons there's like a hundred mm-hmm. pigeons and they're you know all mm-hmm. over the place and it eventually turns into dust and when i'm down there i with a leaf blower mm-hmm. blown off it's like a it seems like a dust of like pigeon crap. you need to bb gun those things it's in the city. I mean, they're gonna report me. I can't. I can't do that. Night. Yeah. I'll get you a thermal. That night pigeon hunt. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I. I think. Uh, I think a lot of people just. You know, it's kind of the bandwagon thing. Like, you know, the Monsanto thing is has been there for a while, right? I mean, the people just piling on and piling on to that side of things. But, you know, uh, it's no different than you know. I'm sure we've all seen a lot of the. Hey, this is what like an actual steak's supposed to look like. This is what your steak in the grocery store looks like. It's not supposed to look like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know how many people people question that? Yeah, not that many. Right. Can, yeah. can can we talk a little bit about chemicals? I mean, since you bring it up, it's I'm kind of curious. I know uh, I think on our last podcast we got a lot of suggestions about like you know different things that we we should or shouldn't be doing. Mm-hmm. I guess for the switch and like because my knowledge is pretty limited. Yeah. Um, and Eric, I don't know. If we pretty talk- much have one thing in our equipment box, and it's glyph. well, yeah, gl- glyphosate kills, <laughs> yeah. and then we've got uh, <laughs> a people. Yeah, glyphosate kills, <laughs> and then we've got um, what's what's the grass selective for clover? Clethodim. Clethodim, we've got, which I've had some, mm-hmm. I've had some mixed success with. I know some guys swear by it. I use butyrac or two four DB for like clover and chicory to kill broadleafs. Okay. Does it not also kill your clover and? Nope. That's and why chicory? you use it. Uterac? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And recently, simazine. Is simazine pre-emergent? for my pre-emergent for broadleafs. Okay. Yep. For corn and or switch. Yeah. What are we missing, Eric? Do we pretty much have our bases covered with that? Yeah. For what you guys are doing, I would I would, I would, would say so, yeah. Um, 
um, you can get as fancy as you want, um, but you know, you're not trying to make money on it and get, you know, 200 bushel corn or yeah, 80 bushel beans. So, I mean, you know, yeah, you got it. I mean, there's definitely certain things you can do, but it, it's the whole picture, you know, when you're doing the stuff for deer or even, even farming in general, but you know, it's that whole picture, like what, what kind of equipment do you have? How, you know, how many acres, how much time, what size equipment? And then, you know, you got to look at your ground conditions. I mean, you know, does no till make sense? I mean, we were talking about before we came on here, it's, it's for us, it's a, it's a timing thing. So like on my deer plots, we're trying to do no till. Yep. Is that, but in our, in our farming, you know, life for, for a living, it's, it's conventional tillage and, yep. and there's various, and there's various reasons for that, you know? So. And when you say uh, Eric, a con- conventional tillage, that's just a grain mm-hmm. drill into a, a tilled field, right? Yeah. So like you go in with a chisel plow, as your primary tillage and then you're fitting it down getting a seed bed ready with like a di- like a speed disc or a uh field cultivator and then you're planting it yeah. yeah which is a lot of time i mean think of i mean that's three passes right correct yeah sometimes more if the ground conditions are different but um you know for us it's it's you know we've got some for instance if you've got manure to put on mm-hmm. okay you gotta you know, that has to get worked in somehow um if you've got um ruts from the previous harvest you know you got to go in there and, and and get those worked out so i mean if if you had a perfect scenario every year and at the end of the fall your all your fields were perfectly flat leveled and, and ready to go well you know that would be that would be great but that's not reality especially in the northeast yeah um, so yeah, we're on, I mean, you got a conventional till and then you, you could go like a hybrid, which would be like a minimum till and what a minimum till would be, I don't know if you know what a strip till is Mm-mm. strip till would actually just goes in <clears throat> and works, works at the, the width of the row that you need. Mm-hmm. So it'd be like, oh, I don't know what it is, maybe a foot wide. And then everything, everything in between is not tilled at all. Mm-hmm. So you get, put the strips down and then you plant on top of that. So that would be like a minimum till. Uh, and there's other versions of minimum till, but then obviously I need to go to the no till, which, um, not many people, I don't think of anybody around me that does the minimum well, see, no till. That's what we were talking about, at least from a, from a farm operation standpoint, because I've, a lot of people. Well, here, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm the dumb one here. I didn't understand the difference between a no till drill and a conventional grain drill until like very, like this past week. I was like, oh, is that why they do that? Cause up until now, like I've never understood why like a, uh. A chisel plow seemed like so much overkill to me. I was like, "What? What is the point of turning all this soil over when you can just drill into it?" Um, it maybe you can elaborate. Like Jeremy and I were uh, deducting that maybe it was like the looseness of the soil. You know, you just mentioned the the levelness of the field. Like that would make sense too. Are are those yeah, the compaction? Com- There's compaction. Compaction. You know, yeah. if you're, you know, if you're going, usually it's wet in the fall. So when you're going in there and harvesting you're compacting that ground when you're driving over it. So that isn't going to just come out of there. You know what I mean? So you go in with a chisel plow or some sort of deep tillage and break that up again. Yeah. Interesting. Um, you know, and- you got to have, if you go to the no-till, you got to be able to handle that trash too. So you got all that corn residue yeah. from the previous year. You got to be able to get through that. Um, you know, as you can see, there's, there's variables that go into it. Our cabbage planter, for instance, likes, zero trash in the field i mean i'm planting an actual transplant like a plug plant so i mean that particular planter there's no there's no road cleaner on it there's right. nothing because it's going so slow so again it's just you know whether you're doing farming for a living or food plots really it's just it's the variability in your particular situation and and you know what how you want to how you want to go about doing it well and eric one of the things that we talked about is the the <clears> fact <throat> that you know let's look at your operation from a let's just say corn or beans you know we're not trying like you said you're not trying to get 200 or uh you know bushels out of a corn or 80 on soybean on a food plot situation right you're you're just literally trying to create good food that's I, what you want i gotta be honest i've never liked that I've never liked it worded that way because like what you're right you know i mean it's, it's not like you know our, our profit depends on it but mm-hmm. well you still want to grow as good a food plot sure. as you can absolutely yeah. but it doesn't yeah. necessarily justify like you know what the practices the that we're time, talking about the here. effort the yeah the you, you can still audiences. there's a point of like diminishing returns as far as yeah. it comes for for well, that's what it is know? it's there's a minimal investment to get a acceptable return out of a food plot whereas you can't do that at, you you still got to balance the books. You can't do yeah. that on your livelihood side of things. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah, you're right though. You you mean what you get out of an acre, whether you're if you're doing it for deer, it's the same thing. If you got to have a certain amount of tonnage to sure. feed your herd. Well, you're, you, hey, why not try to get the highest yield you can? But yep. it does come into that diminishing returns. You got to spend X amount of money to get to that point. And, you know, yeah. is that really worth it? Yeah. So as we're getting yeah. into like that, the no-till like range, so Jer- Jeremy bought one. Um, I rent one from the the county or the township, right? Eric just bought a custom one or is buying a custom a one. A no-till. Mm-hmm. A no-till one. Um, yeah. So, so like what's the appropriate <laughs> approach to like, you know, a, a new – a new spot, you know, like if it's, you know, we've got a couple of different scenarios here. Mm-hmm. Um, I just burned off, you know, 12 acres of old field. Some of it had been tilled and put into soybeans in the past. Jeremy's mm-hmm. is unworked ground, right? Yeah, it's old just, pasture. It's old pasture that he's sprayed and killed. Like curious, you know, what we're going to experience in terms of, you know, these, some of these fields never having been worked and like from your one to two to three, like if there's things that we should be doing, like, you know, and then also what you're looking at doing with your new drill. Well, a lot of times if it hasn't been worked and it was just sitting in pasture, as long as you got your fertility good, you should have pretty good crops. And what, now, do, you, what do you mean by fertility? Like, Well, your, your, your NP and your K, okay. yeah, nutrients. You know, your, your micronutrients in your soil, your, your pH, obviously. Um, but, you know, there's a fine line. Sometimes if it hasn't been farmed, then that, that ground isn't the best per se. But, I mean, the fact that it's been non-farmed and just had cover on it for so many years – you know, that's, that's, that's a pretty darn good condition, you know, especially going in with a no-till. If you can get the seed down in there through all that thatch or whatever, if you burned yeah. a great round of it, I, I mean, you should, you should be on the right track. It should work good. And Eric yeah. is a lot of that because there wasn't a crop in place that was harvesting those nutrients out of the soil. Yeah. And you just have those roots, you have those roots and, and, you know, earthworms, I would assume down yeah. in there just you know making their way down in essence doing the tillage for you over the years so you know you don't you don't need to break all that up assuming you can get through you know whatever you're dealing with on the surface sure get to see yeah Yeah. your point about fertility raises like another question uh for the way that we're doing it is like because i in uh do you have more grain going in the ground or you're done you just no i've got beans going in in kentucky all right how did you fertilize like your corn that you just did i didn't yet (laughs) I'm going to in the next the next trip down. So okay. I just pulled soil samples. Isn't to that see like what a no-no? Isn't aren't you? Can't you like burn your uh, seed I think out? It, yeah, you can. I think. Are you worried about that? No, <laughs> worried about that? Or? No, not so much. <laughs> what do you think, Eric? Uh, you'll definitely burn it, it with, with 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 nitrogen. Yeah, I, top, I'm looking at just phosphorus right now per soil samples. Oh. Yeah, you should. You'd be fine with that. Yeah, I'm not worried. My nitrogen, nitrogen sample was, burns was good. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm not worried about nitrogen on on either of mine. I, I if anything, I took so well. Ohio, I got back already. I just need phosphorus. We'll see what Kentucky has as well. But I I would assume it's similar. Well, well my question that I was getting to is like in, in a no till situation, like how are you how are you applying the fertilizer? Like y- you're not working it into the ground if you're not disking it. Like can are it just can it just go on top? And is that sufficient? time it with a rain i'm trying to figure that out right now with my thing eric yeah that's a that's a good point it's nitrogen gets tricky um on a no-till program so what we use is a product called super u and it's it's like 46 zero zero is the ratio but it's it's stabilized and it's time released so when you're putting on your conventional uh nitrogen you know it's you're gonna it's gonna volatize volatize yep yeah, so this stuff was actually made for no-till practices, and we actually use it on our regular farm and deer stuff. Um, so you put that on, and it, all in the beginning, and it lasts the entire lifespan of that corn. Wow, what's what, what was it called again, Eric? Ready U. It's called Super U. Super U. Yeah, there's another one too. I think I forget the name of it. Um, but it's the same concept, but the one we use is super U. You know, it's a little more money, but it's again it's saving you that time and that efficiency. Yeah. Um, uh, not having to go in on the convention on the on our regular farm, not having to side dress. Yeah, I know. Uh, I think that's he- side dress. What's that? When you go in and put more nitrogen down yeah. part way through a corn oh, slice. Yeah. So I was gonna ask that because, you know, um you know, even think about fall food plots like oats or wheat, like oftentimes you say, you know, a lot of people say, Hey, go, you know, top go get a yeah, top it. dress, hundred pounds of, of nitrogen on that. So in a corn situation with like let's say that super <clears throat> you, like if that corn gets to, I don't know, 
a foot, two feet tall, can you go in there and spray it with that super U or do you risk burning stuff up? Is it a spray or a, you can do it. It's pelletized. Yeah. It is so pelletized. you can, you can do it. You can spread it. We've done it before. It, it'll burn it a little bit, but it's not going to kill it. Yeah. It'll just probably a little bit, but you, yeah, you can, you can do that. So, I mean, at that, that point, I guess, again, different from c- conventional farming for life from a food plot side, if I'm looking at it and, and usually seeing what that like yellow coming down at the bases and stuff, there's nitrogen deficiency. It's like, you know, I might as well hit it. Otherwise I'm going to have issues anyways. Right, right, right. But the beauty of that super U is you can put it on right up front, right when you plant, wow. and it's there the entire. I mean, that's awesome. I'm glad you brought that up. Did do most co ops like know about that? Because I, you know, if just yeah, I'm trying to think of the name of the other one. There's another one. Um, just Google, I'll think Google of that. It, I'll let you guys not non volatile. That's uh, cool. nitrogen application. Yeah, because my, I, you know, I knew the nitrogen side was or sensitive. Stable. I don't, I don't know much about the other ones. I know phosphorus seems to be okay. Like it's not going to really burn much up or anything. Um, mm. And that's the one thing I have to add in Ohio. Like I've, uh, from all my samples and stuff, the recommendation was I need phosphorus in there for the mm. corn. So, mm-hmm. but, is, yeah. is phosphorus potash? Is that uh, no, that? no potassium. potash is potassium. Potassium. Yeah, yeah. Just get them mixed up. Yeah, I've got some uh, in our in our southern tier ground. We got we did soil samples this year. I got some pH of five. Mm. Jeez, that's gonna ugh, it's a lot of lime. Mm. It's a lot. I'm not used to having to do that, but I got to do it. What um right. what are your calcium levels and stuff look like down there? Pretty low too. Ah, uh, good question. I don't remember without looking to be honest with you. Yeah, um, I, mm. I was interested to see like um. So like in the, all the areas in Ohio where I treated with plot start last year, like my calcium levels were like through the roof. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So like in terms of micronutrients, calcium, um, and I think it was magnesium, like those two, like I don't have to, I don't have to worry about those from a corn standpoint. Um, right. I took a soil sample once. <laughs> I decided to take them just, it, I was curious more than anything. I, it Again, that's the fine it line It gives you here. a basis to go Well, from. it's like, you know. You spend time and money, yeah. like you want the crop to succeed. But I mean, let's keep in mind too, most of us on a food plot side, like dude, fertilizer is freaking expensive right now. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's like, less than, it's less than last year though, but yeah. it's still expensive. Yeah. yeah. And so like, you know, when people start to, to look at like what they need on an acre from a fertilization standpoint, you know, it's like some, I mean, I would assume a lot of guys listening to this and I'm guilty of it too, went to Lowe's and got triple 19. Mm-hmm. You know, and I just put a bunch I, of bags of triple nineteen. I, I want to believe at least a, a better a better mode is some of these co ops have wised up at least in areas where guys are planting food plots is like if you call them and just say kind of roughly where you're at they're familiar with the area mm-hmm. you know just say hey I'm planting deer plots here's what I'm putting in it I don't have a soil sample like where what do you recommend I start with and they'll mix you up a cocktail and mm-hmm. a lot of those guys yeah. you know they have uh whatever yeah. whatever those um the gr- the bins the grain. Uh, Tra- trailer type yeah, meals like ready to go they'll, they'll rent, rent them to you and you can pick it up right with oh, your, the, the spreaders yeah a spreader mm-hmm. yeah yeah that's worked yep. out pretty well for us yeah i mean that that seems like especially if you're doing multiple acres like because i've got like a little pull behind on my utv which is nice for a little quarter acre or half acre plot but i start doing three four acres and i'm stopping every yeah you know five minutes to fill that thing back up oh. mm-hmm. so yeah, I mean, I think those are the when you start to look at the program, and or you just accept the results, and it's like, hey, you're gonna cut some corners here, and you may not have as successful of a plot, but you also don't have as much money into it either. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, soybean. If you're looking at soybeans and corn, I mean, soybeans are definitely cheaper to grow. But yeah, you're you know you're not gonna provide the raw tonnage as you are with corn. So yeah. yeah. When you, when you do your recreational property, so we were talking about this earlier, that's why you kind of got this drill. Um, the no-till is, you know, for a long time there, you're broadcasting a lot of this stuff. Are you using similar products and seed on your recreational stuff as you are on your conventional or different? For corn and beans, the same. They yeah. are. Okay. The same, yeah. But like for for the for the greens, you know, clover, brassica, stuff like that. It's it's more of a yeah food plot. We use, based. We use frigid forage, really. Um, yeah, that's what we have good luck with. So that's that's not really. But corn you know, and beans is the same. Yeah, same. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. do you pay attention? 
I'm sorry. Go ahead. Get the, you got to get a day length right. That's so, what I was just going to ask because that's one yeah. thing I have. Like I was looking at corn this year, and I have no freaking idea, right? Like I'm looking at this, and it's like, oh, this is 118 day corn, and this is 120. I was like, I don't know what the hell the difference. Yeah, that's is. long. Those are long ones. You hope yeah. you're putting those in like Kentucky or more south. Yeah, I yeah. So that's where it's like I don't know, you know, what you're looking at on some of those things when it comes down to it. Corn, corn is all new to it. I've never put corn in before. This is Jeremy's first. Yeah, and I don't right. know, yeah, and I don't know if real world or any of those guys talk about it, like on their corn, like if they actually say how many day it is or, yeah, or what. No idea. But I mean, that's the that's the line in the sand between here's the food plot guys and here's the farmers, right? Because mm. a lot of yeah. those food plot guys, yeah, I mean, how many guys in Pennsylvania are going to be planting 118 or 120 day corn, and, and it's not the right corn for them. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah. they don't. Know. I mean, I have to plant. From my two properties again you know one higher elevation further to the south but the south doesn't make it warmer it's actually shorter so i mean i'm doing sometimes even like an 85 90 day variety down there versus it, you know at the home farm it's more you know you'll do 100 103 at the top end so so what's that it mean? Does. it all revolves some of it revolves around the the frost dates too mm. you know i mean the ground you got so many heat units growing degree days but you're 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 susceptible to that frost on them higher elevations so you 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 got to push your planting day back and then as you push it back it doesn't have as many days to mature so that's why you got to drop the days yeah that makes and sense. you want as many days as possible right yeah generally more days leads to higher yield yeah it does i mean it's it, it it's not a might it, it it does but they you know with the genetics and stuff like that they've got it where you can get yeah, I mean, on the farm, we can get 200 bushel yield with a 95, 96 day variety. Yeah. So, you know, it's possible. Yeah. So, I know you said. Uh, okay, wait, there... but one, just just so we yeah. have this as people are listening in to it. So, real world is 109 day corn. So, I, yeah, yeah. I, think, I thought that one was long. Yeah, so, I would keep that's... that in mind from, you know, if you're planting in, I would assume what, Kentucky, Southern Ohio, like places like that, you're okay. Um, but yeah. you start getting up north, 109 days is that's a long it's a long season stretch there. Um, Correct. Some of the stuff I had two different. I had a 96 uh, that I put in um, Ohio, but I, I planted 114 in Kentucky. I mean, dude, I gotta believe the the number of guys planting corn as food plots, like in the northeastern states especially, is like less than five percent of guys that are planting food plots. Probably. It's hard because the management of it going into the next year is tough because mm. there's so much residue, you know? And mm. I mean, assuming the deer eat it all, you then still you're do great. Something. If, if they don't eat it all, which I have that in sort of some of my plots, you're going to deal with volunteer corn in the next spring and it's going to be a pain in the neck. Yep. If you want to go back in there and try to plant corn again, you you know, you're going to have all that volunteer. It's going to be thicker than heck and they're never going to put a years on. So, yep. You're better off rotating that to beans, and then you can spray grass killer on the beans and kill the corn. Is that what happens, Eric? Does volunteer not grow ears? Well, what happens is if you think about how many thousands of ears are on those corn stalks, you till those things under, they're all going to, every single one of those seeds is going to start shooting up a, 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 a sprout and a stalk. Yep. So they're just going to be thousands of them in a small area and you, it's going to look like grass. That's oh. what it's going to do. So you come in next, the next year, hypothetically put beans in and then nuke the volunteer corn. You got it. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, you know, I have spots where there's, there is not a kernel of corn left. And then, you know, in those spots you're good, you know? Mm-hmm. So it really comes down to what's left over when you get to, you know, that later part of winter, early spring. Yeah, and then on top of that, you you get all that stock to deal with too. Yeah. So if, if somebody doesn't have a mower yep. or a disc, yeah, you're in trouble. You know, you're gonna be. It's tough. You know. Let, yeah. me, let me ask you this, Eric. This is a million dollar question. I'm glad I remembered to ask you. How much does it cost a farmer to plant an acre of corn? Well, that's. I mean, it's that's gonna vary on the. What's your land rent? What's your you know? You got variability across. I mean, we may be paying. 150 175 let's call, let's call it, an acre let's call it 75 dollar an acre rent that's, well that's cheap so i mean you're gonna be you're gonna be 500 bucks 600 bucks wow. is what it cost me to to plant an acre of corn as a farmer that's yeah, all I that's mean, all that's, in i mean 
Yeah, probably. Okay. Pretty close. Well, Pretty I close. think a lot of people ask that question because people We're trying wanna, to hold our farmers accountable as well. Well, they also want to leave like a lot of the, to your point, people not planning it is because they can pick up the phone to the farmer and say, "Hey, could you leave that acre in this corner? Or could you leave, you know, an acre and a half over here?" Well, let, let me you ask have to you. understand the cost there involved for asking that to the farmer because most people will get a call and they'll say, you know, "Oh yeah, six hundred bucks, I'll I'll leave that acre," and they're like, "What?" Thought it was gonna be like two hundred bucks or a hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. you got six hundred bucks well, in cost in it. No, it's usually right. more than. I think I've asked them to leave an acre, and they're like, "Yeah, it's twelve hundred bucks." And I'm like, "Yeah." So, 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 I mean, so my next question, Eric, was gonna be, "How much can yeah. you profit from an acre of corn on a seventy-five dollar acre lease?" Same, same well, situation. Well, right. you know what? How much? You know how much nitrogen you putting on? How much um, average? You know, That's your, adequate. you know what I mean? I mean, you, 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 you know. On a good, what's the market too? You know, um, the, just give me a, a ballpark. Six. I mean, if it's six dollar corn, uh, and you're really hitting it hard, and in, in you know good ground, and your your rent's not going to be seventy five dollars in good ground. So I mean, you know, you should look to three hundred bucks an acre, maybe two hundred bucks. Depends on your you know where your costs are at. You got to be. And then also, me. you know, if you want to get real in depth, you know, how you doing your your, your numbers and are you yeah. put really putting everything into it? I mean, overhead and uh, depreciation, things like that. So, I mean, I know I'm giving you a no, that's great. So, I mean, there's answer, but I mean, good chance, Eric, though, you could have, let's say, an acre of corn could make a total of a thousand dollars, but you would have maybe 750 in cost into that. That sounds like an, that's on good ground, right? Yeah. I mean, if you do, if you do 200 bushel times six dollars a bushel, it's 1200 bucks. I mean, that's, that's kind of where it's at right now. $6. Right Wasn't it yeah, just higher? Six. Oh, it's been going all over the place, yeah. but I mean, it's right around that six to six twenty five, something like that net to, you know, to the farm. And historically, is that pretty good? Yes. Yeah. I mean, historically it is, except, you know, historically our costs haven't been this. Exactly. Know, this well, I mean, that's. That's the offset there. Your margin's getting eaten up. So, so let me keep going down that road then, Eric, because what I'm getting at is like, is it realistic to try to work a deal with somebody who's cash renting your place and, and planting crops to, you know, to, to leave some acreage here and there? Because we, we obviously don't want to steal profit out of their pocket by expecting them to just give us the acreage back at cost. That's not the deal. Um, yeah, I think what you got to keep in mind is if coming from a farmer's perspective, they're going to look at it like, all right, so I'm going to leave him. He's going to pay me. He's going to leave three acres over there. And what if the deer don't eat it all? That's what they're going to look. They're going to start. Remember what I told you about the volunteer corn? Yeah. So they're going to come back and they're going to be like, well, next year it's going to be a mess. There's all these stalks. They're not combined. I got to disc them, till them. And then if I got volunteer corn, I got to deal with that. Might be an extra spray over here. Loss of yield. So as a large farm, I can, I can, and me, I can sympathize with a deer hunter and see what they're trying to do. But if a farmer doesn't deer hunt, and they're strictly looking at it from and they don't for the most part yeah yeah and they're going to be looking at it. if they're running things lean and mean they're going to be looking at it like yeah i don't want that extra aggravation sure and i think i've seen this and this is a maybe part of a bigger story but the more things you can control put in your control as a hunter i think the better like i don't want to take the chance because i've had guys tell a farmer i want to leave five acres of corn and they go back out and they left like a quarter acre. Oh yeah, right? absolutely. Sure. And, and when it's gone, it's gone. I mean, you can't, I mean, you, you can't bait. In, I mean, you can in some states, but I mean, <laughs> you know, you get one chance. Right. At it. That's the thing. Yeah. When it's so, gone, like, it's gone. Yeah. And like, I just, I'm a big believer in. I'm a hundred percent. I'm a hundred percent with you, dude. I think what, yeah. what I'm also looking at it like, man, you know, let, let's say in a situation that you've got, uh, I don't know. Some, some people can relate to like, you know, you've got uh, like a, a 40 acre field leased, right? You know, is, mm -hmm. is it realistic? You know, as the guy, as the landowner, you know, as I'm hunting her, is it realistic to say like, hey, you know, I just want, I want two acres of corn left at the back of it B because the alternative cost is, you know, I need to buy stuff to, to, to plant, plant two it. acres of corn. Like sure, that's yeah. way more expensive well, than. And so here, counter to that, and um, he's probably going to eventually listen to this, but Skalma. Yeah. in a lot of his places. He's the one that in, put us on us. He's like, you need to work a deal with your farmer in a lot, front. Yeah, but in a lot of his places in Wisconsin, he's not he's not even charging cash rent. Mm -hmm. He's just saying, if you're going to plant 50 acres, 
you're going to leave yeah. me 12 and a half. Here's where you're going to leave them, but you don't pay me a dime. You just harvest well, the see, rest. But that's a ratio that's like kind of makes sense. Yeah. You know, we're, yeah. I, I'm yeah. not anywhere. Yeah, I'm not close to that. I know, but that, I'm just saying that's that's been the approach that continues to come into play. And you, because you have to understand, like I'm sure when Eric's out there, I don't know how many acres you're harvesting a corn a year, but a lot. Like to then be like, oh man, I got to remember to leave this guy an acre and a half. Like a pain in the ass, dude. I just want to harvest the shit and get the hell out of sure, there. Sure, I get it. I get. It. Well, yeah. So you want to make it as e I, I know, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it'll make it as easy for them as possible. Because I also want to be streamlined. Like when I'm even just planting my food plots and stuff. But like, I I think it would be advantageous if we could understand a fair number and also understand like it's it's not just cost out of our pocket to say as the landowner to say, hey, I'm going to pay you to leave this. It's you know, kind of take it out of my proceeds from the remainder of you know of mm -hmm. the acreage that's leased here. So like it can make a ton of sense from a hunter standpoint, you know, f for ease, you know, for cost, for, you know, all, all the reasons listed above, you know, to just work a deal with your farmer if they're willing to tolerate it and if it's a, for the right price. Yeah, it, it needs to be worth their while. And I just gave you some of the reasons why they may be hesitant. Yep. And so did you. But yeah, I mean, those deals like Jeremy was talking about um, with, I don't know what that other fellow is you meant, but mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, you can, you can make it very advantageous to the farmer. And mm -hmm. don't pay me any rent, plant the whole field, do whatever you want, but just leave me whatever I tell you every year. Mm. I mean, most people would probably jump at that if it's the ratio that you were talking about. Yeah. That's probably what eventually I'm going to do in Kentucky. Like I'm, I'm trying to do it myself this year, but you know, we'll see how it actually works out is I'd love to find a farmer in the area, especially if I don't get good crop out of it this year. Like if it, the soil's really messed up, I'd love to find a farmer and say, Hey man, have at it, you farm it, you know, I'm going to ask you to leave me whatever, 10 of the 50 acres standing in grain. Let's do this. Robert. And then this will be fun. You know, you take the rest of the money, but think about from a landowner perspective, the money and effort he's putting in to get those farm grounds back into productive crop is increasing the price of my property. If it was pasture and it's about to be fertile tillable, that's going to seaside the price of my property as well, which is a huge benefit. Mm -hmm. well, so yeah it, it's and also from a farmer's perspective the ground has to be well drained um and at least in our area you get into some really wet stuff and yep. there's a reason it's not farmed um so you know the the farmer's going to take that risk of putting all that money out there for the crop and if the if the ground isn't in a condition to support that or to give you a fighting chance you know they're probably not gonna even if you gave it to them for nothing they may not want to do right. it right yeah yeah, and at least in my area, the problem is I've got majority of my area is cattle farms, and there isn't really anybody or very few doing actual ag planning. So it's finding a farmer who wants to drive to that farm to make it worth the while. Yeah. It's not like yeah, he's just field hopping across the street type of thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, but that's probably really good for your deer hunting, the fact that there isn't any Absolutely. Farm. That's the, yeah, that's I mean, the hope, at least, right? If I create yeah, the no, farm, it it's the magnet. Yeah, no, that's exciting. Those are, yeah, it'll be, it'll be good. It'll be good. Well, it helps uh, for yeah, us to understand, man. Here? Go ahead. Here it is, calculator. I was trying, yeah, I was trying to figure out, <laughs> you know, and that if it's 12 acres out of 50, you know, what's, you know, what that uh, works out to like at the end of the day. So it's like, you know, if I, if I have uh, $30,000 at $600 an acre into planting that, mm -hmm. right? Wait, say that again. So if it costs me 30000 you know, $600 an acre. Yep. Well, I mean, whatever. Ball yeah, I mean, yeah six, so thirty thirty thousand dollars to plant fifty acres. Yep. Okay. Uh, and so, if I could potentially profit twelve hundred dollars an acre, that's sixty thousand dollars. No. Yes. Okay. Yep. Well, profit. You mean well, thirty thousand dollars revenue, profit. revenue, not profit. Yeah. Revenue. yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so profit 12, would be thirty. Six, sixty thousand minus thirty thousand. Uh, so it's 30, 12, 000. twelve acres times. Which one do we want? Do we want cost or we want? Well, you're going to have to have cost plus because there's time and effort put into it too. So even say maybe it's not market. It, well, most of them do charge market value. I mean, I would, right? Six bucks, six bucks yeah. a bushel. You got to charge market value. Right. Well, but that's, yeah. you, you would want to work a deal that is at cost. You can. I don't think they'll do it. You can. If yeah, there's like not a farmer, the farmer's not going to, the farmer's goal or any businessman isn't to go out and just break even. And if you just try to work yeah. out what it costs them to put it in, that that's breaking even in essence. 
I mean, I mean? Well, everybody the, I've talked to ha- will leave it, but you're paying market value to leave it. Well, but if what you're asking them to leave is one, one to two percent, you know, twelve acres to fifty, yeah, I can understand. But mm-hmm. if it's you know five acres out of three hundred and fifty, like seems a, a little bit more. I worth bet they while. still charge you six bucks a bushel or whatever market value. It's is. your contract to sign as the landowner. Sure. So I mean, you can work the deal up front. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. But I mean, yeah. use that example yeah. of 300, you know, acres. Let's say he charges you six grand to leave the five acres. I mean, you know, again, you can net that out of the contract or give it back. You're still making a shitload of money on your cash rent, probably. Sure. $21,000 or something at 75 sure. bucks, 25,000. Sure. So you're still netting. 16. I guess that's what I'm trying to get to the bottom of is what, what is a fair number I, per acre? You know, I guess it, it depends on your acres that you have leased. It's got it. I'm not trying be, to rip our farmer no, off no, no, at no. all. It's got to at least be cost plus, right? Cause he's not going to do it for cost Agreed. because his time is into that as well. So it's cost plus, you know, maybe he gives you a discount on market. But again, I think probably if you're like an Eric who's farming thousands of acres, you don't want to sit there and squabble over five acres left or not. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. that's, that's just, well, yeah, that five acres to the farmer is nothing is nothing, but to the hunter, I mean, that could be your season. Mm-hmm. That's a huge deal. Yeah. yeah. So would you just, why wouldn't you just pay market value for it then? Because you own the land that they're leasing, like you have. I'm I'm saying you as a landowner, I think, have more control over the lease than people want to admit. Maybe before it's signed. Yeah, and you sign them every year. Yeah, that, that's what yeah. I'm I mean, if it's if if, you, if the land is desirable to the farmer, then I mean they're going to have an incentive to work with you. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. And I'm not saying to manipulate or leverage that at all, but I'm saying you as a landowner, yeah. I think you know. I think it just has to be worth it. Like if you are only farming a 40 acre field and you want five acres left and you don't want to, you want to pay cost. Yeah. He's going to say, yeah, no, I get it. Cause I mean, the juice isn't it. worth the squeeze. Sure. You know, sure. but it yeah. is a, and I think it's a, it's an important discussion because it's a touchy one too. I know. Well, but I think there's a lot of, there's Hair a lot of people everything. who probably either aren't getting grain left because they don't know how to approach the situation or they're getting pissed off at the farmer because they think that they should only be paying cost, and it's like, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. and hopefully this conversation, you know, bring brings that to light. So, so what would it cost me to go plant an acre of corn? Uh, I mean, I could tell you, and again, not not including my equipment and stuff or my time out there, just in terms of seed, fertilizer. Um, you know, I probably have, I don't know. 250 to 300 bucks an acre into it, you know, and that's, but that's a, a single pass with a no-till drill fertilizer and, and you said not, well, and not chemical. counting your implement. Yeah. Not counting my equipment. Yeah. You say your equipment, right? That's yeah. The, right. That's the big one. So, I mean, it's yeah. 300 to 350 and it's surely not going to produce 200 bushel corn. Right. I mean, well, well, I guess what I'm getting at there is like to try to figure out, all right, you know, if I have to pay the farmer a thousand bucks an acre, mm-hmm. uh, you know, over, however many years versus you know my time and effort plus to buy an implement to put it in it's like wh- where's the break even well, here's the, which is better here's the twist of that if you're the landowner and you're cash renting i think it's a it's a no-brainer you you find a compromise you make you get your cash rent from the farmer he leaves you some crop you're good but what if you're the guy hunting a private land and you want crop left and you don't own it now you're in deep shit yeah i mean you don't really have an option well uh, you don't have an option but at the same time there's not many people listening to this who are going to pay six thousand dollars to leave five thousand five acres of corn yeah you're talking to one <laughs> okay that's a lot of money yeah but most of that is going to be on your own land yeah yeah okay i see what you're you saying see what so, i'm saying so yeah in the case where you're the landowner it's coming out of your yeah, proceeds yeah. so you're you, still netting positive you're still but netting, as, as the as yeah. just the hunter who's hunting my neighbor's farm and you may be paying to hunt there to begin with six grand to leave five acres of corn yes. holy yeah. cow man yeah. i mean that's where the the numbers start to add yeah. up pretty quickly and i mean again you know it's not the farmer trying to rip you off. I mean, he's just running a business. That's just what the value is on it. But, you know, you have to really evaluate, is it worth leaving it up um, versus, you know, planting it yourself or, or figuring out something, you know, or, you know, I mean, I grew up just hunting it until it went down. Once it was down, it was down, you know, yeah. it's just, it's just how I used it was. to just blame a black, black bear. It's like running over with the shoe and be like, I thought a black bear was rolling around all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, and also when they harvest it, you know, these machines are getting so efficient. There's yes. not much left, yeah. Yeah. you know, and then, um, you know, sometimes, you know, we're talking strictly corn. It can be used for silage. 
And sure. then they're chopping the whole dang thing. And then it's just a, it's a wasteland after that. Yeah. Uh, I, I was going to ask, mind too, oh, go ahead, these Andy. costs we're talking about are corn. So, I mean, that's yeah, yeah. the most expensive exactly. thing got. So, yeah. you know. Beans you just, and stuff start to come down from there. Well, but dude, corn, corn is like, dude, just, you know, to, to try to recreate like a Midwestern environment. Like there, there are few as deadly of approaches as like a mowed cornfield with standing yes. corn to approach through. Like it's just, it just kills deer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I mean the cost is there, but the, obviously the benefit is also there. <laughs> so stay tuned, Eric. We my uh, a guy that lets me hunt. He and I hunt his property uh, near my farm in Ohio. We moved a muddy <laughs> a muddy box blind uh, into the a middle of this field that's going to get planted in corn here, and like we're hoping to work a deal with the <laughs> with the farmer. It's like, yeah, hey, the blind's already there. Like, can we buy this whole? It's a two and a half acre field, you know. And if that ends yeah. up being I, grand. I would hope, yeah, twenty five hundred to three thousand. You know, for for this year, that might make sense. But we have the equipment and stuff, and so maybe that's one that at some point it's like, hey, just don't worry about that field back there. Let's take it out of the the, the contract, and we'll we'll plant. I would that. assume a farmer would rather that, right, Eric? Just saying, hey, don't don't plant that two acres. We'll you know. Yeah, and usually like the the areas that a hunter would want to leave, uh, like back corners and things, yep. they're the least desirable to the farm anyway. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, I in our situation, if I had some guy on a piece of ground, I would probably just prefer him to say, "I'll take care of that little chunk myself and just stay out of it." That you know, that'd be me. But yeah, everybody's gonna be a little different, as you know. Yeah, so, I think. Yeah, that, let me know how you make that. All right, I think that relationship is important. Like with, yeah. with your farm, like you know, I think some people are just af- afraid to even mm-hmm. talk to them. They're like, "I just." Give me the check every year, you know. It's like I just get to know, just talk to, just uh, have a relationship with your yeah. farmer, you know, and l- like let them know what your intentions are. I mean, are they're cause... one of the most well connected people in the in the area in terms of <laughs> knowing what deer and what landowners want to do and where's hunting happening and where's hunting not happening. Like that, you want them to. You got to read between the lines a little bit, but but yeah, sure, <laughs> yeah. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Stealth Cam. Dude, where would we be without our cell cams? I would definitely be divorced at this point. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. I mean, the fact is, is I spent more time checking cameras than I actually did hunting prior to cell cameras. Now, at least my wife can enjoy me being in the comfort of my own home, buried in my phone, checking those pictures. Yeah, 100%. And dude, when it comes to uh, trail cameras and definitely cell cameras, reliability is, I think, the number one thing that we're looking for. Stealth Cam just has a long reputation of reliable cameras, and ultimately, that is the most important thing to us. They have to work. In terms of reliability, there's not a better camera on the market than Stealth Cam, whether you're talking about the Fusion X, the Reactor, or the DS4K Transmit. And most of them are under 200 bucks. Southcam.com. Check them out. We talked a little bit there about the corn aspect of things and obviously beans being cheaper. Um, you know, when you start to, like you were talking about the efficiency of these, these harvesting machines now not leaving like any waste grain behind, um, you know, up where you're at in New York, I assume it's harder than maybe somebody in the South, but you know, I know a lot of people probably are coming in after some of those early season harvests to try to, you know, get a fall plot or a cereal grain plot in some of those spaces that, you know, have been harvested. Does that, um, does that kind of tread on your territory a little bit that's as a, a great, farmer? That's a great question. So you're saying if a, if a deer hunter is trying to come in and put something on Yeah, so let's say, the, yes, yep. yeah, you pull it off, right? You pull it off and there's a little corner back there and a guy comes in and puts a, you know, half if, acre. If beans come off September 1st, can yep. I go in and put oats down? They're like, yeah. does that work? My, my question is around yeah. the chemical, like, do they spray in the fall? Like, is there something that would prevent me from doing that? Yeah. You wouldn't normally, nah, you wouldn't normally be spraying anything chemical wise that kill anything in the fall. That'll just take care of itself in the winter. So, uh, it, it, it wouldn't really, wouldn't be a problem to do that. I mean, having a cover crop in essence is what you're doing. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Farmers, I just, yeah. I mean, you should be trying to do that anyways every year. So yeah, uh, I wouldn't be, and, you know, and the whole cover crop brings into part of the discussion is, you know, if the crop does come off, say it's soybeans, September, I mean, it's not September here, but yeah, where yeah. you're at. A lot of times a farm will go in and put yeah wheat winter wheat or something. Or something. There. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean the whole thing. So I mean, and that kind of shifts the equation a little bit too. And then is wheat going to be enough of an attractant? Yeah, mm-hmm. maybe. But there is something growing there. And from maybe, a, you, can put, maybe you can put a little big and beastie or you know brassica. Yeah, there, you know what I mean, something from, like that. From Maybe a conventional that. farm side, there, Eric. Most of us kind of looking at it from the outside in. You know, if beans were in and come off, that's usually what 
will potentially get, you know, um, a planting of winter wheat or something. They won't necessarily do that when corn has been in the ground. Yeah, it's, it's too late. Too late. Because uh, you need to plant, at least in my part of the country, you want to get your wheat in from like September 15th until, you know, depends on the year, but at the latest November 1st, I mean, pretty much October in the 20s is where you're kind of you're cut off because you don't get enough growth. Yep. Um, so yeah, your corn, your corn's coming off and a lot of times November. So you're just, you're past that. You're past that for, prime side of things. Yeah. Yeah, cover crops and corn are a tough combination. That's well, I was going to, so I mean, it sounds like from a corn aspect, if anybody is planting corn or something's been left, you know, you've got that through the winter. Obviously, you know, you're likely, if it's not mowed down, you're going to have some sort of volunteer kernels popping in the springtime. Your only mm-hmm. option, really, from a backup to a corn is either plant corn again or plant beans and nuke the corn or clover and nuke the corn or something like that. Kill, kill, the, kill it out as a grass. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, that, those are, that's a summary of it. Yeah. I mean, you could always, you got a couple other things. You could do a fall planting the next year too, you know? Sure. Um, Just leave it. Spring. Yeah. If you're talking spring, then yeah, those would be the best, best options. Yeah. Would you still go in and nuke that volunteer corn in the spring if you were going to do a fall planting? Yeah. So to be clear, usually that those stalks will need to get in order for those to grow, they're going to need to get into the soil some. So if the stalks are just sitting on the surface, they're not really going to do much. They're just going to rot away. But as you, when you till them in and you get, in essence, just like you're planting them, that's when they'll start to mm. grow. Gotcha. So, so, yeah. so hypothetically, if you cut, um, if you had corn growing this year into the fall and winter, uh, and then let's say next, you know, so let's say even in the wintertime after deer season, you come in, mow your corn, like just, you know, brush hog your corn down. Can yeah. you expect that spring to have volunteer corn or do you think it'll just sit there on the top? I think it'll just sit there on top for the most part. Okay. Yeah. So, so, think of it, think of it as like how you actually plant corn, right? Yep. When you're yeah. planting your seed, you got to get it in the ground, you know, a couple inches. Yeah. So if it's not in the ground, it doesn't have that soil to work with and it's really not going to, it's just going to sit there and yep. rise. Oh, look how it is. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Since you bring that up, is there any advantage or difference between like just running over corn, like for a late season food source versus actually mowing it with a brush hop? Uh, in terms of attraction, I don't think there's a lot of difference in that, to be honest with you, because I've done both. Um, I prefer the mowing, I think, because I think it, it spreads the corn a little bit more. So it kind of makes the deer in my opinion, maybe have to move a little bit more versus yeah. having those full stock right there and just or for full, you know, cob. Mm-hmm. Um, but the reason I like to mow too is it chops up those stalks. So the following spring they're just a little more manageable. Yeah. Because those things, I mean, those are like, I mean, they're yeah, <laughs> they're stout, you know, yeah. they're meant yeah. to stand up. And and um, you know, if you chop them up that even the combines, you know, now that they, they have they, most of them have a chopping head. So as they're combining it, they're shredding all that stuff. Hmm. Yeah. That's an interesting subject too. You hear that a lot in the baiting discussion of some of these cornfields getting mowed down, you know, during season in a non baiting state. Mm-hmm. I mean, they make a good point. Yeah. Well, what's the, and what's the debate that uh, that is? That's baiting. <laughs> that's like, what's the difference between that and taking a bag of corn? And- well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the, the, there's, I don't know if it's a fine line as much as it is kind of a, a gray spectrum of like what, 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 <laughs> what quantifies as baiting or not. It's like, is the, is the cornfield left standing? Does that qualify as baiting? Yeah. Does it, if it's run over with a mule or a ranger, does that qualify as baiting or is it not until it's been you know, run over the brush hog and distributed, or is it only if it's dumped that, out of a bag into a specific location? That's what I'm saying. Location? I mean, like, what if it's Which of those there? is baiting? A, yeah. B, C, or D? <laughs> yeah. 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 Good yeah, question. Tough question. And you'll have a lot of people say, you know, like, my my thought process around it would be by the book, D, right? Which is dumped out of a bag. My, mine would be as well. Because, I mean, I planted it. The corn was there. The fact I mowed it, like, that, it, that I didn't place it there. Like, it's it grew there. For me, it has to do with uh, just like the food, you know, people say food plots are, sure. are uh, you know, and I disagree. I think f- for all the reasons that we mentioned, you know, during that discussion, uh, mainly the like the intention and the effort that goes into it. Like, you know, even if you said, you know, you can plant a cornfield mm-hmm. and that's not 
consider baiting, like 99% of people still won't do it, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Sure. Yeah, no, I would agree. Yeah. And it's not so concentrated like baiting. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still, it's spread out. You can't, mm -hmm. you know, you're not pouring out a bag in one, you know, five yard section. So yeah, there's, it, 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 it's, you got to draw the line it, somewhere you know, is what it is. It, it is. You got to draw the line yeah. somewhere. Yeah. You can't yeah, not plant farm fields because baiting. Well, illegal, it is. It's right? a super gray yeah. area because people, I mean, we've all probably seen and they're better now about it, but I mean, I used to drive past where, you know, the combine was loading in the truck and there's 600 pounds of corn <laughs> still happens. Still right happens. Right there. And you're like yeah. looking around like, <laughs> huh? looking for a tree stand, like tie <laughs> yeah. on you. Yeah, I mean, and but in in that situation, it's not baiting, right? I mean, it's it right. naturally from, occurring, naturally occurring wow. from the field, kind of. That's the gray spectrum. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'm not saying that you should probably sit up there with your bow right over top of it. Like that might look a little suspicious, but I mean, right. I I also think it's a gray area. I don't think you legally would be prosecuted for baiting if you were hunting that field. You can't bait in New York, can you? On on private land. Correct. You can't, you can't, yeah, you can't any, anywhere. No, in New York, private, public, nothing. Nope. Nope. I know. Which I like personally. I mean, New York doesn't get a lot right, but yeah, I, I, I do Huge. like that. Yeah. We've talked about it a lot recently. So in Ohio, uh, Jeremy and I both hunt in Ohio and it is legal there. And I think it's personally like the, the worst thing that that's currently, you know, that the state's experience. You guys talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. yeah. And it's not that it's a, it's not that it's a new thing. It. It's that it's now paired with all these new technologies like cell cameras and crossbows and straight wall rifles and you know, yeah. the seasons yeah. and stuff. So, yeah. yeah, I, I think that the, um, I think that the, the aspect and, and it is the effort. I mean, the argument is simply, you know, if I have a bag of corn, I can walk anywhere, anytime, dump it and it will be there. Right. The yeah. fact is, even if I walk into the middle woods and with a single row corn planter and drill corn, it's not going, it's not guaranteed to be there. Mm. Like if it doesn't grow and it doesn't put it on ears, yeah. there is no corn. And it's not just purely that. It's just the line needs to be drawn in, in accordance with like the likelihood of, you know, or the fairness or this whatever of killing a deer over it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like, that's where you decide to have the line. I think. And there's just some self restraint morality in that as well. I mean, we've talked about it before. I mean, you know, either you can bait if it's legal, go for it. You know, it's open. I don't, for me, it's not an ethical decision. Like in terms of like me versus the animal, like, mm. yes, I, I don't necessarily, but I don't think it's unethical to kill a deer over corn. I've done, I killed that deer right there. You mm -hmm. know, what, there was a remnants of a corn pile. Um, I think it has more to do with the, the public resource aspect of it. You know, the, the limited public sure. resource and the effect that I'm having on other people's resources and vice versa. You know, I, I think that for me has a lot to do a lot more to do with my opinion on baiting. Have you hunted any bait states, Eric, like Ohio or Kansas or anything? I went to Kentucky last yep, year. Kentucky. Um, but we didn't we didn't bait. Um, I don't even know if the entire place they did any baiting. They might have, but where we we did we didn't want I you know, I just chose not to do it. Um, it was a big enough acre a big enough farm where Yeah. It wasn't a you know you weren't competing crazy with neighbors that did so i mean um, i i think that if you you know whether you're planting like on the food plot level that i'm doing or even on the large scale ag level that eric's doing i think if you establish corn in like a actual plot for hunting that you have a much better chance of mature buck use on that than a corn pile interesting point I, i've never gotten the opportunity to experience one next to the other i i 100 i have in kansas but, well if it's corn to corn i can tell you f for a fact if it's like big and beastie or yeah, clover yeah. versus a corn pile they're gonna walk right through it to the corn, corn pile. pile but yeah like you say if you have like a corn pile whether regardless of like the state that it's in if it's been mowed mm -hmm. or versus a corn pile over there do you well, I guess Eric wouldn't have experience because you can't it, dump a corn I've pile I've seen there, it but. in Kansas where when they had planted some of the 80 in corn and, and left a lot of waste grain. Like I would put a corn pile out and the amount of they pictures. They didn't touch pile. Yeah. Non in some cases, it was like, man, there's not really any deer. Then you look up and there's 40 deer out in the field because there's corn everywhere. Especially when there's the mature bucks. I would they for know. sure button bucks and stuff. They're going to yeah, be just they're be flocking on your piles. Like I prefer yeah. the pile. But the mature buck side, they they know. Yeah. You know, I mean, it it's and I think even from a huntability, we've talked about that before. You know, everybody says, oh, it's easy, just dump a pile of corn and kill it. Like, 
you know, those bucks know how to approach that thing. They know the wind. If you're hunting like an actual feed grain field and stuff, you have a lot more flexibility in how you're going to set up and how that deer is going to move through that field versus a three foot round pile of corn. Well, here's the thing too, just to, I mean, the situation is complicated enough as it is, but like you could argue that corn is like one of the least attractive baits that there is. Like it only gets better from there. Like yeah, I can dump apple flavoring on it. I got like mm-hmm. the Walmart shelves are chock full of like all the Acorn above and beyond attractants, and stuff, you know, yeah. dumb molasses on there and all this great stuff. The co-ops are all selling like specialty deer. It's got sweet yeah. beef feed in it and stuff. And so, you know, corn v. corn is, while I appreciate the question, you know, it's kind of the, that's. Sure. The, the, they sell in New York. It's as legal as heck. And, and they sell minerals. Oh, yeah. They I do know, it here, man. too. Yeah, I don't You go down to Royal King down the street, dude, and it's like the, Piles. The, during deer season, the, the uh, pallets of corn, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Eric, this is probably not loaded for you because it's not as applicable in New York versus some of these other ones, but we've had this discussion so, uh, numerous times. It How much from a farm, let's say a farmer's standpoint, do you think that some of these farmers are making from selling deer corn to hunters? I, I don't really know. I don't know. I don't, I don't. I don't know any situation like that, to be honest. Yeah, because so I'm assuming non- the stuff you see in this, you're talking about like a farm selling directly to it. Well, somebody. no, not even like to the co-op. So like my local co-op in Kentucky is selling shelled corn from local Kentucky farms. Yeah, maybe percentage of their business is a better way to ask it. So in a, in a uh, baiting state, what percentage of a, f- a farmer's proceeds come from selling corn to be used. And at- let me let me piggyback on it. And the reason was because we talked about the Ohio of potentially ever getting away from yeah, baiting. The What's the economic impact, impact on our farmers? Because right? that's the one thing we don't want to do is our farmers to actually have a an economic impact because they can't sell their corn to deer hunters. Basically, yeah. I would say it'd be very minimal. Very minimal. Where do you say? Who do you sell most of yours to? Not like specifically, but what what industries do you sell most of your crops to? Uh, well, for, for, for the, for the corn and beans, it would be, you know, there, there's some ethanol still in New York, okay. but a lot of it just goes for, uh, cow feed and then also human stuff, you know, where they're using corn to make, you yep. know, whatever cornmeal type stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, there's, there's, I think even in a state like Ohio, you mentioned that you can be, I don't think that's a huge, that, I don't think it's going to be a big deal at all to be honest with you. That'd be interesting. I now. really want to know what it is because I my it's, it, it's going to be one of the pushbacks that come is like oh, this is the economic impact of deer corn and da da da. I I think it's a lot, Eric. I think I do. Yeah. I don't think you understand. No offense. I, I don't. I don't know how anybody could understand like the amount of baiting that happens, uh, like especially in the state of Ohio, like like. You know, it's just, it's in that perfect mix here where we have like the, the Midwest meets the, the demographic from the East. You know, you've got a bunch of, myself included, you know, Pennsylvania guys, New York, Maryland, a bunch of us, you know, we come to Ohio and everybody buys, you know, it's not expensive to buy. I could buy 5,000 pounds of corn for five, 500 bucks, you know, five, 600 bucks, something like that. Um, and how much does a bushel weigh? 56 pounds. 56 pounds in a bushel. Yeah, do the math on that. I'm curious if they're selling it so much Se- cheaper. It's seven pounds, a ba- seven pounds of bags is what we're buying for, 50-pound bags. Seven, $7 a bag. Yeah, sorry. $7 a bag for 50-pound 50 50 pound bag. bags. So, okay, so, so that's that's yeah, over I mean, market price, right? If it's six, bit, and, six a and a quarter. Bit, yeah. yeah, so maybe seven fifty ish they're selling it for. So what? So right. what is that? So if I buy, uh, and I've, I, I might even got it for six last year. So, so I do 5,000 divided by 50. Uh-huh. Times seven. That's seven hundred dollars for five thousand pounds of corn. Mm-hmm. Well, I was just looking at it as the fifty-pound bag. Yeah, I, I didn't. I, it's probably it. like seven dollars and fifty cents on a on a bushel is what they're charging. Yeah. And more. Yeah, and more. I, mean, I think that's that's certainly fair because if you say you're paying the farmer six six twenty five, I mean you you know you got a markup there. I mean yeah, so they're making a buck fifty two bucks profit. Well, yeah, I mean, you got some bagging expense, sure. you know, you got to get it to this, you know, they're buying it in big quantities. They got to get it down to small. So you've got some, you know, you got some uh, mm-hmm. expense there. But. Well, that was, you bought direct from farmer there. Yeah. I buy it directly. So from, it, and most oh, people, a lot of people do. Cause I, I was going to say on the, um, I don't know if it was, I think it was, it was last year when corn prices were up, Eric. 
Um, yeah, they're higher than they are right now. Because I, I know at one point I was paying like nine seventy five to ten bucks for a fifty pound sack of corn. For, direct from a farmer? No, 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 from the co op. It still is yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, I, dude, you go. Yeah, that's to, a pretty good markup there. That that that's a bigger markup. That's but, a yeah, know, four to five dollar markup wow. to the business. And the guy that's buying a fifty pound bag, forgive me, fifty pound bag of corn from like Rural King is not going to buy five thousand pounds of it. They're no, going to no, go no. in there buy their hundred fifty two hundred pounds and yeah, they're done. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, that's where you see the markup direct. I mean, that farmer's making over market value selling direct to you. At mm-hmm. seven fifty per bushel, he's also bagging it all himself. So he's earning every bit of margin yep. he's got. He farms exactly. it, he bags so it. So he's and probably he's selling. selling it right about at margin by the time you put bagging costs and all that other stuff in there. Yeah. Whereas the co-op is marking it up fifty percent almost. I, I don't. It's tough for me to answer that because I, I don't. I don't have a good grasp of that at all. Like what it's like in this state and how much that really contributes. But I mean, is it I mean, hard to I fathom it for you? Like that. That like that actually is an economical feed for potential farmers just because no, of the way you do see, business I mean, no i mean if it, it it's kind of like a value it's almost like value added product so if a guy can do it bag it up and sell it i mean you're adding value there so it's it's you know it's obviously more potential for more margin so i mean good for the farms i just don't i can't grasp the um the size of it i guess yeah the scale I'm, yeah. Is, yeah, I mean, I don't. I mean, how much does that contribute to farm economy? I mean, I, I don't. I don't know. It is. Know. It's definitely from a time frame. Like it's. It's got to be extremely condensed compared to. You know, I, I don't know over what course of time you guys make most of your income. Like, I, I, just via farming practices, but like with a, you know, buying corn for baiting. Yeah, there's what percentage of hunters are bow or crossbow hunters? Not a ton. Ten percent. I mean, low amounts in August, September being sold in October. Then November is the majority, and December is the majority. I mean, it'd be the <laughs> week before gun season. You know, they must yeah. sell millions of pounds of corn. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I mean, literally, I've driven across the Ohio River. You know, following uh, pickup trucks whose entire beds have like <laughs> tarp, and it's like overflowing with corn. Like it's I, every day. You know, during that time of year, that's what you see. Jeez. And see, going back to the point about the, the the crops in the field, I mean, think about how much time it takes to grow a corn crop. Mm-hmm. And you can't tell me that that's that that's like baiting because it's, it's not. not. You have so much variables from beginning yeah. to end, and all the effort that goes into that. Yeah. And then you just drive to the store and load up your truck and dump it. I mean, it's instantaneous. So you know, it's always like the guys that you know you talk to them and they're like, "Oh, it must be nice to have food plots." And I, you know, we, we kind of give it back. It's like, well, yeah, they just appear, you know, they just pop up. <laughs> yeah. They just come out of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, so well, it's like, you know, yeah. I, I mean, I look at the, the aesthetic aspect of the hunt as well. Like think about like if you're on a farm and it's got, you got, you know, corn is just turned, you got a green food plot, like, you know, leaves are turning like that aesthetic feel you put yourself in. Now flip the switch, still have the leaves and stuff falling, but it's an overgrown field with a big pile of yellow in front of you, right? And I mean, both ways you can be successful, you know, but ultimately from the experience of the hunt and how you want to remember that buck working that wood line, pounding scrapes along the corn row or something, it's just, you know, it's however you want it. Even beyond that, dude, let alone the, yeah, the look of a cornfield versus a corn pile, those bucks, they do know. And I'm, you know, you absolutely can kill a buck off of a corn pile. Uh, but th- they are far more alert, you know, around something like that. Like they know that's not right, mm-hmm. you know, and, and they don't necessarily act that way. Uh, like in, in a food plot, certainly not as much. And the bigger the field, it seems like the less concerned they are. They're like, oh, this is normal. This yep. is what I is yeah. supposed I've been, to be I've been here. eating in this all year. Like it's, I've watched right. it grow. I've passed through it how many times? So the mannerisms of the deer are, it's a much more like, you know, organic experience to hunt an animal in that situation. Mm-hmm. I think it's human nature. You want that instant satisfaction. It is. I went to a, I went to a Don Higgins seminar in New York last summer, and they had a Q and A at the end. And the most questions were about minerals, and you can't even use them in New York. What the hell? So I mean, it's like you know what I mean. It's like, like people are just wired to like, how can I quick dump something out mm-hmm. and, and get this satisfaction? And you know, along the same lines, as you mature as a deer hunter, or some people do, some people don't. I mean, but it's about that experience like how did it all happen how did you get from you know harvesting the animal and then all all the events leading up to it and just what personally gives you that satisfaction you know for me it doesn't do it but some people i guess if you just want to pull the trigger and get it done as easy as possible yeah there's 
there's definitely different situations. So like, you know, a lot of what we're talking about is we've got these farms we're managing. We want to see them develop. We want to see the deer thrive on them. Like there's, there's a passionate 365 for us in that. Right now flip the switch. Let's say you're hunting Ohio and you have three acres. There ain't much you can do with that. Right. If you want to get deer on your camera and you want to get deer when you're sitting in a tree stand, Odds are you're dumping a corn pile on that three wow, acres. Dude, and he, here's the unfortunate thing. This is the last thing I'll say about, be, you know, and we can move on from the baiting thing here, but, like, uh, what's the most unfortunate thing about baiting, in my opinion, you know, baiting states, is that it, it forces people who don't want to bait to have to, you know, because and people want to act like, you know, well, you, can, you don't have to on your property. Like, you can just do that. I can tell you from, you know, six, seven years of, of you know, firsthand experience on a large, large amount of acreage that, uh, mm-hmm. you have to, if you, if you want to even have like a, a chance, you know, at, at get some of these deer, you have to, you don't have a choice. And it's not just killing them. It's a chance at saving them yeah. to get older. Yeah. 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 And, it, and it doesn't guarantee anything, but yeah. Yeah. So New York's got that right. It's one thing you won't find much else, but New York does have that baiting. I'm glad we don't. I'm glad we can't bait here. I think yeah. you'll see more and more states going away from it. I mean, because of the CWD issues and and just the way things have gone into that direction, and you know, it, it again, it'll be a battle. There'll be lobbyists involved, but at some point, it will go away in in the majority of states um, because of disease would be the driving force behind it, mm-hmm. um, and also from a non hunting sector right i don't think anybody would see a picture of a hunter with a cornfield and a food plot and think that person's cheating right whereas if they see that picture of a guy and there's a big corn pile in front of them they're like that doesn't seem fair right you know so when we talk about a lot of these states you have to remember that some of the decision makers are not hunters right they they're just trying to try to interpret what's fair to them, going out and dumping a big pile of corn and shooting a deer over it probably isn't what strikes them as fair. So yeah. I think you'll have that play into the the lawmaker effect here sooner than later as well. Yeah, yeah you're right, 100%. I've got a lot of parallels with farm laws and who's making those laws is kind of what you're saying. That yeah. Hunters aren't going to make them. It's just like in New York, we're getting controlled by downstate and they're making all these rules for farms. And they don't even have a clue of the reality on the farm. So, yeah, that's the that's the world we live in right now, unfortunately. Well, we've heard a lot, at least from the New York State side, on on policy changes around um, heating with natural gas and wood burning devices in in New York yeah. State, and how those changes are coming down. And it it is forcing a, a lot of people are selling farms and moving to Pennsylvania. You know, mainly uh, Amish. I, I would I would put myself if I didn't. Moving what I have is difficult, but I would not live in New York if it wasn't for the profession that I do and just the the amount of assets that come with it and trying to move all that. But I would be out of here in, a, in short order. Yeah. Yeah. And it, again, it's because although maybe from the population standpoint, it's 50, 60 percent of the state from state size standpoint, it's three percent. Right. You know, yeah. it's it's literally New York City and it's buffering. And then everything upstate is just kind of sitting there saying, what do you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But that's, that's yep. how you'll get it. I mean, hunting's going to be the same way. Like, and, and people will say, well, you know, I don't believe in CWD. Well, it exists and it kills deer. Like you can argue the science all you want. It's just how it is, you know, and that will lead to people questioning if baiting should be legal and it will be decided on by people who have no concept of what baiting is, but they'll look at it as cheating, and that will be the end of baiting. You know, whether it's yeah. next year or five years from now, it's absolutely going to happen. And do you think it will have a real harmful effect on the deer themselves? No. What? what? The removal of baiting? Not, not, not baiting. No. Absolutely none. Now, I will say, and I've had this you argument. You mean, like, do deer depend on the bait? Yeah. No. No. I mean, well, it, there's there'll be enough other I yeah. mean, food sources well food I'll, sources and then like depending on what your your herd size is i mean it, all of a sudden you knock off that bait i see that that you is know. the big argument it is it is and it's a fair argument there are plenty of people that will tell you especially in ohio that there are already too many deer well so so the well and yeah okay well so the question is like how how do you offset the compensation for harvest well even point? before that how 
you know, what's the amount, the number of people or, or, or baiting programs that are actively sustaining herds? Like the state, the herds need for, you know, for that. They bait don't, to be in place. but it is, I would say that it is attributing to population control, <clears throat> meaning our harvests are escalated because baiting makes it easier. Mm. Okay. So, so when you take that away, we're inevitably going to, first of all, we're going to lose hunters, right? Cause people will say it's too hard. I'm not going to go on hunt. And then you're going to decrease the harvest, which is going to increase the population. And that, that will be an issue. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That is the, that's the offset balance there of what is the impact there now? So, yeah, so if we can't kill deer as effectively, yeah, what, what is the... Now, do we become under scrutiny for, yeah, okay. you know, uh, from insurance claims and all this other BS that's out there? Well, so, you know, we've talked about um, the quotas and stuff. I mean, is there a potential, like, offset to that, you know? So if it's like, you know, we, well, you say, hey, we can we'll raise the number of deer, you're allowed to kill more does. I mean, would you kill more does? If, yeah. I don't think, I don't know if I would. <laughs> Like, I mean, I killed those as it is, but like, do I want to go out and shoot seven more? Probably not. It's a lot of work. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, I, I think here, here would be the counter to that. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of times we'll hear, you know, uh, at least in business, like you hear, you know, 80% of your sales come from 20% of your sales force or whatever it is. Do you think that same thing applies to hunters? Do you think that like 70 or 80% of the harvest are attributed to 20% of the hunters? In my no, opinion, they tell yeah. you. You think I, so, Eric? Yeah. They tell you, right? I think that, I mean, if you were asking me, I didn't know who you were asking, but. Yeah, I know. I'm a firm believer that the good, you know, the ones that really want to hunt, the serious hunters can be extremely efficient and you don't necessarily need more people in the woods. Hey, I can make the argument that more people in the woods leads to less kills, to be honest with you. Sure. Um, so if you give, you know, if you give the, the people that really want to do it seriously and know how to know how to hunt them effectively, they can, I mean, yeah, you I, can control. Them. I think there's ways to offset it. So like what you're talking about, earn a buck, earn a buck is going to be one of them that comes up. Earn a buck yeah. or like, you know, and, and, and I don't know, like, and I'm not proposing any of these necessarily. We're just spitballing ideas, but like, you know, let's say, let's say that did happen. You say, Hey, we got rid of baiting. You know, now we can't kill deer nearly as efficiently, mm -hmm. you know, maybe even it's not efficiently. Well, some people couldn't kill them as efficiently, but we're going to drop numbers in addition to that. We're going to drop hunter numbers because people are going to say it's too yeah, hard. So what if you combat that with just something like an elongated gun season? Truthfully, and I've said it before, I, w I would prefer uh, like even a longer gun season or higher quotas. Oh, because what happens with sure. the baiting is, be good is directly affecting the quality of the buck herd. Yep. Right. Like that's where your three and four year olds are getting killed yep. and two year olds and whatever. With these other things that you propose, it's not necessarily targeting that age structure of, mm -hmm. of bucks. You know, it's just deer in general. Like we, 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 you know, a lot of gun hunters would say, yeah, I'd shoot more does if I had a longer season or just more deer in general. Yeah, more deer and in that general. doesn't necessarily mean that age class. So I think by doing that, we're trying to protect this the quality of, of bucks in the herd, mm -hmm. you know, while not having negative increases with more deer and, you know, I mean, that's overall. the offset, right? Cause we, it, we've had a lot of conversations of this after Skip was on here talking about, you know, Iowa and, and things like that. And so we've brought up things like Ohio baiting and, and you know, we, we have these discussions because these are the questions that if it ever came to be ready to pass, this is the pushback you're going to get. Right. Well, you guys are going to kill less deer, which means there's going to be more deer vehicle collisions, which means insurance companies are going to bitch, which means their lobbyists are going to come to us and figure out how do we kill more deer? Or should we hire paid snipers to do it or whatever? Right. Mm -hmm. Hunting's no longer efficient. Mm -hmm. it, these are, and again, it's not because those people are hunters, it's because they're not hunters and they have no idea how these dynamics work, which you would mm -hmm. think is on the DNRs or the game commission, but there's a line there that's very hard for them to cross. It's not an easy, easy problem to solve. I, I, you know, as, as a responsible hunter, I mean, I think you gotta, just like Jeremy's saying, don't rely on the DNR or in our case, DEC. I mean, you gotta look, you gotta be in tune with your local deer herd. And if yep. you need to cut back on your harvest and cut back, but I mean, if you've seen more and you need to kill more then by all means respond and do it. And, you know, it can fluctuate. I mean, five years from now, it could be different than it is right now, but mm -hmm. it's the hunter's responsibility ultimately. And, you know, the ones that are doing the land management, I would argue are probably the most in tune with it and care the most about it. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I would, 
I don't like to rely on what the, the government's telling you in terms of tier numbers and, and what's going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's difficult. To their defense, it, it, it's so, I mean, you could drive here 15 minutes down the road and you could have a problem and then you come back a different direction and it'd be drastically different. And it's just for whatever reason, you know, that, that, that you know, habitat, food, whatever it is. I mean, you could, the deer numbers could be that much different. Mm-hmm. So in the DC is doing these big blocks of ground, you know, we got yep. management units and yep. within that, which is what unit, we have here yeah, too. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And so I, I think one way to kind of not test it, but to see what happens is, um, Pennsylvania Game Commission just released that they're going to allocate somewhere north of 120 or 130,000 more doe tags this year than last year. Okay, so that's substantial. Now, when those go in play, do we harvest more does than we did the year prior? Like, in and, and at what rate, right? So you added, I think it was, I don't know if it was 10%, I think it was 10% or something like that, more doe tags or 15% more doe tags in. Does your harvest increase next year by that rate? Or what, what What I've seen in the past is it doesn't. I think it has to be coupled by opportunity, you know? So whether it's access to lands or like length of season, like it's like, you can't just say, here's more, more tags. tags in the exact same scenario. Like you, maybe you need to- That's why Pittsburgh keeps falling, right? I mean, they, they keep throwing more doe tags in the in the 2B or Pittsburgh area. Yeah, so it's not a tag There's no issue. more where to hunt. Like you can put right. as many doe tags as you want in there. There's no more to hunt. Like. You, I can go to the courthouse and buy it. Where the hell am I going to go use it? Right. So, I mean, that's that's where this thing, again, from a, an understanding of, okay, you're trying to provide more opportunity. You're you're giving us more leeway um, in what we can harvest, but does it is it going to actually lead to more harvest, right? Yeah. And, or, you know, to Eric's point, the guys who are super serious and are doing land management, they don't give a shit what the bounds from the the government is they're going to manage it on the micro level to their property if they need to shoot the max number of deer they will if the deer they don't because it's lower population they're not seeing as much they had a bad fawning year whatever well then they're not going to shoot five does they're going to shoot one doe and maybe a buck and then that's it so i mean it's you know this is the challenge in it yeah, and I'd also wonder along the same lines. Uh, Jared was talking about making the, the gun season longer. I mean, is there is there stats that that actually increases harvest? Well, we've asked. We well, at least asked the game commission here in Pennsylvania because they recently opened Sunday hunting for us. Uh, we have we have now one additional Sunday, so we basically have one additional day of the what was ten day season for for gun season. And so the question was, you know, how many more deer did we kill? The answer is we'll let you know because they're not, they're not addressing it on that single day. Now, if we look at it from the season standpoint, we are killing supposedly, and this is again, a whole different ball of wax, but the estimates for harvest numbers in probably New York and Pennsylvania and a lot of other States to me are just complete wet noodle on the wall. Right. I mean, you're extrapolating 40,000 harvest to get to 400,000 that, that there's too much variation in there. Anybody knows that like, it's a data trend. It's not an exact number. Don't try to make it an exact number. Um, it's it's a tough question, man. I I'm not I don't envy the game commission being in the position of having to, you know, because I'm you know I'm sure they want better deer too. Who doesn't absolutely. want big deer, right? They should. It's their employment. And so, like, as you go down this route, this route here, it's like, what uh, you know? So, what do we do? Like, if we don't have baiting, how do we control the deer herd? We, you know, we impose things like maybe crossbows or straight wall. You know, we we make deer hunting easier. Um, but well, that, that goes back to that. How many of the people, how many of the hunters are killing the majority of deer? Because I would assume to Eric's point, if they're the serious hardcore hunter, right? A lot of people listening to this, if they took away baiting in Ohio, those people would still figure out ways to kill deer. No doubt. Probably be more, For it'd sure. Probably be, it'd probably be better. Yeah. Because they're going to put in the work yep. and do the food plots. And then the guy that, yeah, you know, they're going to see more that. deer on their property because of the land yeah. management aspect they did. Yeah. Cause they're stealing them away from corn piles on small parcels around it. Like your farm, right. your farm would effectively have who knows how many more deer all season using it because the corn piles around you disappeared. That was pulling them off. Now it's up to you and the family to determine how many deer you actually want to harvest, but your opportunity at harvesting would be higher. Well, and honestly, like it's hard to say for sure, but like if that were the case, like uh, you know, at that micro level, I would probably be inclined to be like, hey, we need to like open our farm up to get some people out here to shoot does. 
Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. You know, and it's funny because I don't feel that way, dude. Now, Eric, like when you know, because it's such a limited resource, and we it's so hard for us to get four and five year old deer. That's like, yeah, I don't want to let anybody in. You know, it's just like we got to be lock and key here. Uh, but that's because they're all getting killed. You know, on the neighbor's three acre track because they dump. You know, you can dump corn. You can do it that way. I want to believe. You know, it's just like the uh, I can't think of the uh, assimilation for that, but it's like, man, if we if that was removed and we had an overabundance of deer, like I would be, I would be way more inclined. It's like my cup is overflowing, right? I want to like bring people in to, t- to, to help us with that problem, right? To take advantage and it creates opportunities for more people. Instead it's Man, a defensive like reaction wall right yeah. now. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. that's, that's a, uh, you know, do what do you guys do? So, I mean, you're in a situation where there's no, do you bring people in to shoot? How do you control your herd up there? Yeah. So where the numbers are higher, um, we've started this tradition with the Just Hunt Club guys. These guys come from New Hampshire and, you know, farther east than me with very low deer numbers. And we have like this, we call it just a, a doe fest, you know, and ironically, those doe, those doe, we killed, I don't know, we killed like eight or nine of them this year in just a couple of days. So I am inviting people in and it's, it's fun as heck too. I mean, those yeah. guys, if you invite the right people. Yep. You get tags. I mean, the landowners are going to get the tags and you just, you know, have them use your tags and they got to buy their license. But um, yeah. it's a ton of fun. It's yeah. a ton of fun. Yeah. I, I got to just be really, you got to be, you know, be, be precise with it too. You know, we don't drag it out. We're using rifles for the most part. Yep. Sure. And it's just, efficient. You know, and out efficient. efficient. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we're spread out. You know, I've got, you know, different farms and they're spread out. So it's not like you got, eight people on one 40 acre piece it's just it's spread out but do you have it's a lot of fun do you have dmap tags and stuff issued on yours as well yeah Yeah. uh sorry um yes dmap yes but not the nuisance ones i don't not the nuisance like red tag well it's called red tags in our area i don't know up there okay yeah i don't mess with them in the in the summer um we don't we get some damage but it's it's not it's not worth it i'd rather just be do it in the fall well i mean i think that if you probably are consistent in your management practices and harvest practices during the season to get them to the level that's controllable going into winter and come spring and summer. It's not like they're smashing everything. Correct. You, yeah. You've managed. And again, them. one, one thing you got to be careful of is if you have that late season food attraction, yep. you're going to all of a sudden potentially think you have a numbers problem yep. and, and you may for, for, for that time frame, but you got to remember you're drawing in, yeah, your sponge effect and 40, everybody. 50% maybe more. Yep. So you got to be a little bit careful in what time of year you're, you know, you're, you're analyzing your numbers. Yeah, no, I think that's a big, a big thing. Cause you hear that a lot from people, you know, whether, uh, and I hear that even in the summertime, like if I'm in an area that's all cattle and I've got a couple big bean fields, you know, I might see 30 or 40 deer a night in those bean fields. Well, yeah. you know, once acorns start dropping and those beans start turning, you know, those same deer are now spread across multiple ridges, you know, in a several square mile area, not just all reporting to a single bean field every night. Um, And so, you know, and that used to be the big thing you'd hear it all the time is people would scout bean fields and scout bean fields. That's where their stand was. Season would open in early October and they're like, man, just not seeing the deer like I was. Well, yeah, they're, they're not, their beans aren't green anymore, right? They're not on those food sources. They've shifted at that point and you haven't shifted your tree stand. You've hunted them like they're it's July. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Been there, done that in my younger years. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I had one tree stand that was built out of two by fours, you know, it, well, it didn't matter if it was November or October, like I was sitting in it. How, how, just how many was. articles do you think have been written about like the, that opening day conundrum? Oh Yeah. <laughs> Like even until five, five years ago, it's like, you still, it's like people are still writing articles about this. Like, yeah, we get it. Yeah. (laughs) They're not there on opening day. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think it just comes down to, yeah, you learn from your experiences, you know, back in the day you had one stand, like it was the stand you went to, no matter what wind it was, no matter what time of year it was like, that was, that was it. If you're sitting in a tree stand, that was the one you had. Um, and I think that people start to look at, you know, um, kind of the way hunting has evolved not just in like, you know, people wanting to kill bigger bucks, but just to your point, the efficiency of how we hunt, the the cell cameras, you know, everything that we have in our in our hands and our fingertips. And, you know, it, if you took it away, if you if you, you know, change the system and said, hey, you know, you can't bait in Kansas anymore, Kentucky or whatever, you would lose a giant amount of hunters out of the gate because they've adapted themselves to this is how hunting is and it's easy. 
And when it becomes hard and difficult, it won't do it. Um, and that's that weird fine line that we talked about in that I would assume the three of us, I mean, we were grinding growing up. We, we failed a lot. Oh, it would be the we, best thing we, that ever happened. We it, would make, it would make hunting great again. <laughs> yeah, but see, the, the counter to that. Now, one thing I looked at the other day, and I, I was misinformed, or at least I thought I was misinformed on this, is I was assuming that most of the Department of Natural Resources and stuff um, are gaining their money from license sales, hunter license sales. Obviously, a portion of that also coming from federal funding. At least in a game commission report recently, most of the funding sounds like it's coming from oil and gas and timber. Yeah. Yeah, property ownership. Which I think is interesting because where does that put motives of decision making towards the hunters who are the smallest portion of the revenue contribution or towards well, they the can, natural they resource? Can, they can work in tandem. But but yeah. Can I mean, they? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, because I mean, if if you make money off of land ownership, your motivation would be to, to own more land, you know, and you could say, which, and they open access to hunting. Mm -hmm. I guess you could say, well, yeah, but what does that do? What does that do for your private landowners? What do you mean? What What's the value? What's the decision making mindset for your private landowners then? Yeah, I don't know. They, they, I don't know. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Hoyt Archery. Dude, where would we be without our Hoyt bows? Probably shooting crossbows. <laughs> or, or a Matthews, yeah. <laughs> One and the same. Yeah. But in all seriousness, we love being Hoyt guys because you stand out. When you're in this room full of other people that shoot these other types of bows, I feel like the Hoyt guys just stick out. Huh. Dude, it's just a legit bow. I mean, th th especially that carbon riser, man. I mean, I, I know that they've got several other aluminum lines as well. But for, for me, I'm shooting that RX-5 uh, in the carbon model. They've since come out with the RX-7. And uh, I can't tell you how much I love being a Hoyt guy amongst a C4 of Matthews guys. So we're out there, I think, pr proving them wrong, shooting 80 pounds and uh, you know, killing stuff. Hey, man, if you want to get serious, get Hoyt. So, Eric, since, are you still good? We still got some time here? I'm good. I'm All good, right. yep. So, dude, I think, I don't remember exactly when we talked last time, but I know that we circled around uh, the CRP discussion and, like, you know, plant and switch grass. And mm -hmm. since then, we've had some some big projects underway. I think both Jeremy and I. Mm -hmm. uh, if you yeah. remember, I was struggling with that. I, we had a big, uh, I was like a, a 20 or 30 acre section that was yeah, like right. old pasture and like fescue and I wasn't sure what to do with it. Um, I'll tell you what, we, what we've what we done with it. I decided to go with a, an old field restoration type of a, approach as opposed to plant and switch. Um, not that I won't go back and do that in certain areas uh, in the future type of deal, but um, what I did was, and this was like the, the Craig Harper model. This is kind of where I, I took this from. So all that old fat fescue, old pasture ground, uh, we went and sprayed that uh, in, I believe in the month of October. Mm -hmm. Okay. So at that point, all of our broad leaves, like our ragweeds, all of, you know, whatever was in there had gone dormant, which, which is kind of crazy to see because, you know, you got there in May or June and it's like the thing's overrun. It looks great, you know, but by the time October rolls around, it was essentially just grass. You know, all you can see is grass and that's what we're trying to kill out. I'm trying to get that out of there. Yeah. So when in October, mid October, uh, sprayed it all with glyphosate, two quarts per acre, um, the, the entire thing sprayed everything. Um, and then shortly thereafter, uh, maybe two, three weeks afterwards. So mid November, uh, went in and dissed all of our fire breaks and, uh, dad, you know, dad went a little overkill on them just cause you know, we don't want, we don't want to burn, you know, the County down. So, you know, right. overkill is good when it comes to fire breaks. So we put all our fire breaks in, made a bunch of different sections to burn off. Um, and so at that point in November, you know, we had fire breaks put in with our grasses killed. Um, and then we, what we did was came back and we ended up doing that burn in February, mm -hmm. like end of February, which I think in hindsight, like maybe it was a little early only, was it? only because, you know, the surrounding stuff was still brown, mm -hmm. you know, and I think the later you get into March, like, yeah, there's less of a risk, you know, mm -hmm. cause when stuff's greening up and stuff, yeah, moisture. But, you know, fortunately, we, you know, went over kill on our brakes and stuff. And so we, we burned everything off, all 20-some acres. And uh, big success. Um, did mainly backing fire, you know, flames. So 
I, it was very noticeable. Like the, the few times we had f- head flames going, it would just kind of glaze over it. You know, you'd burn the top layer, but there was still a lot of thatch. Um, so we did mainly backing burns. It took all day. You know, it took us whatever eight or ten hours. We were out there burning, and uh, but afterwards we were left with ba- basically a blank blank slate. And then Dad went out a few weeks later. You know, because stuff doesn't start greening up until uh, End now, of March, April. E- even yeah, even into April, you know. So I think it was towards the end of March or even getting into April. Dad went out with a disc and turned over everything that we had burned. Just basically ex- expose our uh, that that's that uh, whatever so- soil seed bank, yeah, yeah, seed bank, seed bank mm-hmm. that's in there. You know, pr- yeah. it probably honestly expedited the growth of that stuff. Like a, I would assume a year or two, um, yeah. and that's where we're at. I, I haven't really been back to investigate su- super I mean it'll be a, it should be a ragweed haven probably this summer yeah. would be my guess yeah so that's that's where we're at with it that's neat um I haven't done that exact same thing but the switchgrass is um going okay it's going okay I think the deer use it but I wish I had some I have structure on the edges of it but I don't have structure in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. And I, I kind of wish I did. Um, and uh, we'll see, this is going to be year, I think three, and I've got to burn one of them. I don't have to burn this year. One I do. Um, and I have not done it yet. So, um, that's coming though in the next week, I hope. Um, the old field thing, we didn't go to that extent like you did, but we we've done a lot of turning, uh, old, farm fields into, um, you know, I call them rut fields. That's just what we call them, but you know, bedding areas and stuff. And it just involved, um, a lot of Norway spruce and white pine mixed Mm. in Mm. and just Mm -hmm. give it that structure. And that's worked really good for us. I mean, you just, every year it gets better and better. Um, and plant thousands of trees every year just for either road blockage or, or bedding in those, in those fields. So, and I'm taking, this is on the Southern tier property and that's, I'm not taking $10,000 an acre farm ground. Right. In, sure. in, yeah. So this is on the recreational stuff. So that's where good. And I, I it will continue to do it because that's the ground that's probably going to come for sale in that area. So having that blank slate, it doesn't scare me at all. I think, you know, doing, you know, combination or, or mm. one of the things that we talked about, it just takes more time, but yeah. It it can it can work out tremendous. Yeah. Well the and only reason the only reason that we burned was because there was so much, like so many years of thatch, you know, that had just been yeah. laid over. And it was like yeah. a, the alternatives are I can just keep running a disc through it, you know. And I don't know, it, it probably would have taken like twice as long, right? To get it all turned over. Would have done essentially the same thing. I think burning adds, you know, whatever helps with your pH and there's there's some of that happening too. Um yeah. it just seemed like a, a more a, a more economical approach, you know, with more benefits. So it made sense to burn them off and then disc it afterwards. Sure. Yeah. Um, and you're not going to go plant anything. You're just going to let it go. Whatever yeah. it comes. comes. Yeah. And honestly, I, I would be afraid of planting. Uh, cause we've, we've done white pine and Norway spruce plantings. Uh, I have some, in fact, adjacent to that kind of stuff. Um, okay. and it even struggles with, cause I've planted that right into, you know, what we got rid of essentially, which is the old field and it's, it struggles to compete Th- those trees struggle to compete with just, you know, what's there, right. They kind of get overgrown every year. And then, you know, fortunately some of them make it through, we probably have like a 40, 40% success rate on those. Really? Hmm. Okay. So, so I'm hoping that like our old field stuff has enough structure in and of itself, you know, within three to five years, I've got enough woody brows coming up in there. Sure. Um, yeah, the location of it's important too. You know, if you got stuff, if it's secluded by itself, and you can get by with some shorter, you know, um, cover slash food. But like some of our fields are close to roads, and that's why I, I need that taller, taller pine tree structures in mind. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, we definitely yeah. hear more and more. We've had a lot of discussions around, you know, our deer using switch for bedding in particular. You know, and, and you'll hear some guys, and of course, you know, deer are going to use it on occasion, but you definitely hear more people discussing switch being used as bedding, mainly on the edge 
uh, of structure, right? So on the wood edge, you know, if you feather that edge into the switch, that's where they're bedding. Or if you have islands of structure or old growth inside of your switch, pockets of it, they're laying against that edge. They're bedding against that edge. Which so, could be a massive amount. And honestly, I was thinking even more about, <clears throat> um, I'm not sure if you listened to it or not, Eric, but we had a conversation last week about like a specific field. <clears throat> I think it's like 10 acres mm-hmm. that I was talking about taking out of ag production and planting into switch. <clears throat> and I think per exactly what you're saying there, like that edge feathering, it seems like it can provide so much structure. Like it almost seems like if instead of just doing that whole field and we were talking about splicing in like rows of just old field stuff, so just disc it, but don't plant it. If instead of doing that, like you just would do, just do the entire perimeter of the field, like mm-hmm. still allow them even to, to pl- say to plant it. Um, but around it. And then, so as soon as you plant, just follow all the trees, you know, mm-hmm. out into your, your planting. Mm-hmm. You know, which is going to be tough from a burning standpoint. It's probably the long. You know, yeah, exactly. I know. And that's what I struggle with. I, I don't want to put those pine trees in the switch because that would, you know, they give it the structure. Yeah, but they're torch different, it. You know, yeah. Hmm. How, big do the, how big, I was wondering, do you, how big do the pines have to be in order to survive a fire? Do you know? Or don't they? Well, I don't think are, they do. Are you thinking white pines and stuff? Uh, yes. Norway spruce, white pine. I pretty, pretty damn uh, Torched. Big. Yeah, I mean, your branches would have to be above the burn. So what I would do is I would do, you know, as as cool and low as a burn as possible. You know, if you if you get it like mid level on that tree, you're probably in trouble. But if you run a, you know, a cool low fire along that bottom, you know, it probably would. (laughs) Have you ever seen a Christmas tree catch on fire? (laughs) (laughs) Well, usually they're really really dry, but Yeah. yeah, these wouldn't be. Yeah, super dry. It's just, living, but. If you've got five foot switch around it and you're lighting a head flame on that she thing, gone. yeah, she gone. I want to say, dude, you gotta be she gone. You gotta be twenty five years into that pine tree before it's like because the branches have to be above your burn. Even that, I mean, your roots are gonna take some serious damage at that time because they're evergreens, you know, and so they're always actively, you know, pulling and pushing nutrients. Yeah, I don't think it happens, Eric. Yeah, well, I haven't. Trust me, I haven't tried it. My gut told me uh, don't do it. I just needed. Verification from you experts. That's right, uh, right. That's what we're here right. for. <laughs> You're the burning experts. Right. You can't hardly burn in New York. I mean, it's like an act of Congress to burn here. It's 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 crazy the difference because my grandfather would tell me about just going and burning ditches. Oh yeah. You know, between farm fields, just yep. get rid of the just brush. burn them. If we did that now, we'd have three fire departments. I out know, there. man. That's what we yeah. did. We we called the fire department. We were actually one day. So you know what? That's actually why we burned earlier as opposed to later. Is because once you get into March, yeah, there is a, like a burn ban mm-hmm. in in Ohio. So we had to. I don't know. We just called our local department. It's a small town. I think know? in Kentucky, you actually have to have like a burn certification to burn. Yeah, on a private land. Yeah, I'm know, certified. Certified. <laughs> yeah. Listen, plot twist. What if you well, put uh, artificial <laughs> Christmas trees? In that, there you go. In they there. just melt. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will say this, dude. Burning is not to be taken lightly. Like it, no. it's a pretty serious undertaking. Like, and you can really cause. A I've lot seen of some sketchy social media burns. Listen to this. Here's a decision. Sure. Here's a decision we had to make. Do we burn across the gas line, <laughs> or, or do we put brakes on either side? What if there's a leak in the pipeline? <laughs> you'll know pretty. These quickly. are these are questions yeah. that'll come up. You know, as you're burning, you'll know, you'll know pretty quickly. <laughs> Yeah. You know, does that jet down to the to the main plant and the whole thing goes up, or how's that work? <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's definitely. I mean, you've seen like mainly in the in the Midwest, but I've seen several people with like giant switch grass fields lighting a head fire, and I mean that baby is cooking across there. Yeah, you know, yeah, we, and I mean you hear it; it sounds like a freight train coming through there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, don't, you don't you don't want to. You know, you're not you, your little blower and a shovel isn't going to stop that thing if it gets out of control. I've got a little advantage. It's kind of funny because our the, the Mexican workers that we bring in to work on the farm, most of them grow sugarcane in Mexico and you burn sugarcane. Huh. So they're they're used to like I took them out with me and it was I thought I'd have to kind of like explain what to do and by the end of it they were telling me what to do. And they say in Mexico like their fire breaks between sugarcane fields is literally like feet, not wow. that not that wide. So they you know, they gotta figure out how to put it out. So manpower to jared's point you know yeah you gotta take it seriously and then i just bring more than enough people to you know but to put it in perspective on our 26 acres that we burned i had about 15 guys yeah that's a lot yeah you know because you want you want some some of them 
you know, you, you don't want a guy on like every side. And sure. you don't want most of them having drip torches. You need to have one or two guys like yeah, who know. Everybody else got blowers. Because where you light ranks. that fire, you know, very much dictates how it burns. Um, yeah. So you want to be really careful with that. You want most people to have, uh, well, you know. So with 15 guys, I had two two with drip torches, six or seven with uh, backpack blowers, and the rest with, you know, rakes and shovels, kind of just a- extra guys. Okay. Eric, are you planting your fire breaks, or are you just disking them every time you need to burn? Uh, I got a little of both. Yeah. So, yeah. I got some clover, you yep. know, in some, and then I just, the rest of them, I, we, we disk, yeah. yeah. I've heard, multi, you know, kind of a mixed reaction around that. You know, a lot of people, especially when we talk about switch and creating fire breaks, is goes back to, like, do I want to have clover and, you know, essentially a small food plot running through where I don't Mm -hmm. want, like, I want the deer coming from there, not staying there. Yeah. Um, Yeah. You know, versus, you know, when I need to burn, which is every five years or so, just coming in and re-disking it and just leave it fallow after that. We Mm -hmm. we left ours fallow just because it seemed like too too much to plant. Mm Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I I wanted it to just be kind of a part of, like, the thicket that we're creating. Yeah, I mean, if if it's strategically also a place that you may hunt against, I see the advantage of having some clover breaks and stuff. But if it's something that, like, Hey, I don't. It's like I'm a sanctuary ask. I don't. I'm not gonna go back there. Then I don't really know if you'd want to, versus leave it fallow and you're gonna get briars and forbs and stuff coming up anyways. Yeah. So, hmm. Uh, I guess last thing before we let Eric go is he might be chasing a big buck next year. Hmm. Yeah, it's becoming becoming rather famous uh, already, but there's. Let's just say there's a deer of the size that um, makes headlines and um, he's, you know, he's living on my property for some of his life, not a lot. And I would, I would call it a kind of a long shot for me on this one, just because his home range isn't, isn't me, but you know how it goes at certain times of the year. I know for a fact that he is on some of my ground. So Never in my wildest dreams would I think in New York State that we'd have something like this. Um, Pretty cool. It's going to be interesting <laughs> just because of the the personalities and people, and you know how antlers make people do crazy things. And yeah, um, it'll be interesting because it's it's well known, and it's only going to get more well known. So, what what is the likelihood of that deer getting harvested illegally? I would like to think not very high. Um, but I know it happens and, um, you know, I know what happens in this area, Does it? but um, I think that I, I'm hoping that the saving grace is this, this, it's such a unique deer, right? I mean, there's going to be nothing I think anywhere close to it. So if somebody says they shot it, you know, 20 miles away, it's, it's never going to fly because the word's going to get back. But, yep. you know, I worry about somebody shooting at the end of September and saying, they shot it October 1st, something like that. But You have any uh, bean fields you think he'll be in this summer that you'll be glassing? Yeah, for sure, for sure. I um, I usually don't see deer. It's weird in the summer. I don't have a lot of deer summering on my ground necessarily. I have some, but, yeah, we'll be looking for them. Yeah, we'll be looking for them. We, we went in. Uh, it'll be an interesting study because the, I'm almost a little bit embarrassed, but the, the piece of ground that that deer was actually on of that I own – I did not put much effort into it and I didn't even know he exi- I didn't even know he existed to that extent to that size until probably September of of this year and I had no idea like I figured he was farther away and, and he was for the most part but um we went in and and did a lot of TSI and put some time into this particular block and when I say this particular block I'm talking 15 acres of timber tops. Wow. You know, it's mainly farm fields. So we just tried to make that better because when you walked in it, you were like, well, there's nothing really special about this. So let's try to make it better. And we did. We did a bunch of TSI. Uh, there is a little food plot in there. But um, I guess the interesting thing will be if we can if we can alter that deer and make him come on to us maybe a little bit more because of what we did. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't. I don't really know. I, I think that's all any any of us as bow hunters can like hope for is is the yeah. opportunity to like to to be in the game on a deer like that you know to, like like just a whatever it is like a world class animal or just you know 
uh, for a certain area or even for, for each of us individually. But it's like to, to feel like we're like to have the chance to you chase a, a chance. deer like that, to have, you know, opportunities and to be able to set up and like that, that's, that is the, that's the reason we do it. You know, that's, yeah. I'm, I'm excited yeah. for you to, to have that opportunity. Yeah. It's weird. It's just, it, like I said, it's in a spot that I would probably put at the low end of my list to, for that ever to happen yep. just because it's, it's, it's pressured. But what you got is you have the perfect scenario of genetics and getting some age and you know this deer i don't think that deer i you know i think it might have been four and a half last year gonna be five and a half so i mean you know just it's it, the genetics are what came together it's crazy so yeah yeah well and dude I, I'm, a I, bit, I'm a little bit torn too because it's like i was telling you guys earlier it's like i you know i don't have a lot invested into this deer to get him to this point yeah and you know, for me at this stage, it's about that. It's about that time frame of the deer's life and how much you put into it and trying to raise them and keep them on your ground and not get them killed until he's the right age. And, you know, I was lucky this year to harvest one that is that exact same scenario. And the satisfaction of that is at the top of the list for me. Um, now you have this giant deer, which I don't have a lot of history I, I do a little but not much and i don't have a lot into it in terms of trying to get him you know get him through and have him survive he's not on me a ton but it's just to the size that you gotta you gotta go after it i guess you gotta go after it and it's wow. not like i'll be i won't feel satisfied if i kill it i'm not saying that but oh, yeah. um there's there's a you know what i mean like yeah it's, absolutely it's, well dude that, that level of relationship that you're talking about i can almost guarantee you in the short term that you know you now have like you got a whole summer ahead of you of building history with this year and like you know you'll probably the experience that you know the the work effort and stuff that you put into these other deer like it's going to happen in this next like seven or eight months <laughs> yeah. you know and you'll get to yeah. know them real well yeah yeah and i've never seen a deer on the hoof i mean i didn't even really hunt him to be honest with you because i didn't think he was on I didn't think he was on our property, but come to find out, he, you know, he was. And then at that point it was just late in the year. And I said, just leave it. And I, I didn't have a, well, I did have a tag, I guess, but we didn't, I didn't pursue it. So, um, yeah, it'll be interesting. I mean, if he puts on, I mean, that's deer, just to give you perspective from what I would call, I'm guessing age three and a half to four and a half put on 50 plus inches. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. There are freaks out there that exist, you know, they're yeah. rare. And, you know, like Jared said, to be in a, to potentially be in the game on one of those is what most of us dream of, I think. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I never would have thought it would, I, to this level, I had never imagined it. So, and they found a yeah. shed. So, I mean, he definitely made it through season. He, yeah. He made it through season. So now the, now the waiting game begins, he's going to start to grow and, um, yeah, just see what he see what he turns into. But I, I mean, it's gonna be like I said, it it'll be newsworthy. Uh, whoever happens to if somebody gets him, you know. Obviously, be, you don't like sports that much, but so tonight's the NFL draft, and I, I oh that's right. I envision this deer as like <laughs> like let's say you we were a community of deer. It's like, honestly news what, to me. <laughs> what no, what yeah. would this deer look like in our community of deer? Because he's such just like a a freak of nature basically i dude i don't think that those probably jared and just like physically <laughs> fit dude yeah i didn't That's quite like get cool. i didn't quite get the analogy there but uh well, he's he's unique think of all the deer and what a, a typical mature buck looks like right yeah and then look at this deer especially in a case like new york state yeah where it's just i mean it's literally one <laughs> in how many million it's hard for me to relate because like you know it sounds like eric you guys he's always the top of the Food no, <laughs> no. I was just saying. It sounds like you know you have quite a few deer that reach that age of maturity. Um, at, yes or no? Well, I mean, uh, there's some every year. I mean, I usually can. I usually have a five and a half year old buck to hunt somewhere. Yes, maybe two, maybe three if I'm lucky. So I don't know what you call a lot, but but uh, I mean that's right. over the course of a lot of land, right? Yeah, it's spread out. It's like a checkerboard, you know. I mean, it's yeah. it, it maybe like a five mile radius but it's just it's small chunks here and there okay um, well okay i can relate to that um i guess the re the reason that i said that is uh I, like i feel like i see these freaks all the time like and they just they get killed at three 
they get the kill of three. Oh yeah, you know. Yeah, and yeah. I see. I, that, I see what you're saying. Then. Yeah, because I'm yeah. like, oh, that that deer's going 180 for sure. That uh-huh. deer's going 180 for sure, and then they're gone. Then he's dead. They're gone, and they get yeah. killed at 140. 140 I get that. Five. Yeah. Yeah, it's that's those are that they get. Because this deer, this deer was what one, mid 130s as a three year old, likely. I mean, I would say that what 95 percent of New York hunters would have whacked him in a heartbeat. Oh, yeah. For sure. Well, and yeah. dude, even Ohio uh, hunters. 99%. Would, 99 <laughs> yeah. point something would. Yeah. 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 I mean, even Ohio hunters, you know, yeah. that's where, that's, that's my relation to that is, dude, it's not uncommon for us to have a 145 inch three year old. Like, that's pretty common. Who's on his way to 180 at five. Yeah. But I just gotta believe. never gets there. Yeah. I mean, they just get whacked at two and three and, you know, four. Yeah. And, you know, that, you know, yeah. we're used to, trust me, majority of the ones like, my friend Ethan this year, he killed uh it's a five and a half year old, 135 inch buck. You yeah. know what I mean? I mean, it's it's it doesn't bother me. It it's because I'm like all in on age. Just yeah, shoot them on age. Agree. I don't you know, I don't whatever. They got rack on their head. It's it's the age. And they get to that age, they score 120 or they score two hundred. You know, for yeah, me. Yeah, but Eric, if you have a five year old that scores one thirty and you have a five year old that scores, you know, yeah. 220 yeah. which what yeah. you know no don't you get me take wrong. the 130 like, I, i'm willing to <laughs> I, at this point until that deer dies i'm willing to sacrifice the season just to put in a small chance that i that's make. a buck of a lifetime you have to it's yeah. a buck of a lifetime. yeah 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 it's it's that yeah it's that special so you'll, you'll feel like you're hunting me. a ghost at some point i i guarantee that but until you know he's dead you almost have to keep going after him Right, right. Oh, I'm almost nervous for you. <laughs> <laughs> the pressure. <laughs> well, I'm not. So, so the saving grace a little is, at least not to this point, I'm not what I'd call attached because I haven't seen him on the hoof, right? Yeah, I right. haven't hunted him. Sure, hard at you're all. not. Yeah, you know what I mean. Him. Like, so it, I, I'll be fully. I'll, I'll admit, I get attached to them ones that you hunt, you mm-hmm. see, almost get. And then all of a sudden somebody else kills them. Those are the heartbreakers. And this one, it, you know, if somebody else gets them, I'll be excited for them. Um, you know, but I don't have that attachment yet. But to yeah. Jared's point, uh, that's likely to change. I hope. I hope anyway. Yeah. The minute you see him on the hoof and he's 200 yeah. inches. <laughs> yeah. It is. It is. Uh, it is an interesting thing when you kind of start to look at or think about what you said versus me saying, oh, this deer is just an outlying freak. There are mm. probably plenty of deer that have that potential, just never see it. Yeah. So maybe yeah. the trait is more common than we believe. It's just they also have to get through the gauntlet to get there. Yeah. Well, I was rising this. I said, I asked him, I said, how many deer do you think, you know, would be booners or, or 200 inchers that get killed as three year olds? He's like, well, oh, blow your mind. Yeah. You know, a lot of them. And I don't know that that's necessarily true, like up where you're at. Uh, you know, there's definitely pockets of genetics, you know, genetics have a, a, a big impact, but probably not as big as age. You know, it's the age is a yeah. qualifier, the genetics are the. Yeah. Yeah. But I, this one is, there is a little pocket where this one was, there was like 170 and like 185 inch one killed, like within the last five years. Nice. So I think, you know what I mean? So it's like that within, within what I'd call probably two miles of this area. So for whatever reason, you know, this, the whole genetics thing, you know how it is. You can't, you're yeah. kidding yourself. I think you're going to try to control it. Any, it's just any suspicions it. about like, yeah, oh, he kind of looks like so-and-so or like, you know. Oh, like a, a different deer? Yeah. Uh, uh, you mean like one that I've seen before? Yeah. Not really. I mean, just to have one that with that many points and just. Just a freak. Number of inches. I mean, I don't, I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. Um, Do you get that from time to time? Like, I know there's, you know, we'll see deer that I'm like, oh, dude, that's got to be like the son of so and so. You know, it looks yeah, just like Yeah. <laughs> but, but for us, it's usually like 135 inch deer. Sure. Like, oh, he's got short G2s. He must be just like that other one. You know? Yeah. I'm like, that eight point looks exactly like that eight point from a couple yeah, of years ago. That's, <laughs> that's what we, yeah, that's usually what we get into. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and it's funny, dude, them eight points are so hard to tell apart. You know, there's been years yeah. where I've had like three eight points that were all identical. They were all like, whatever, four year olds. And I'm like, I you can't even tell. I'm them like, apart. how did he travel three miles? I don't know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's yeah, crazy. You gotta really you gotta really squint your eyes to tell the differences from them. Yeah. I remember yeah. last year I had a picture of two of those bucks in the same picture, same trail camera picture. I'm like looking at them I'm like it was the craziest thing. I was like, there are two identical deer standing next to each other. You know, you you'd think that by four years old they've got enough like discernible no, characteristics. Just so like, so typical yeah. around same. 
So, Eric, how um, how will we and people listen and be able to follow this? Are you guys going to do stuff around the Just Hunt Club in the off season, or is it something that we're going to wait till next year to see how things develop? Well, the first thing, um, my hunt from this past year was uh, for a buck that we had a lot of meaning to me. It's called the King, and um, that video has not been put out yet. That's oh, probably cool. going to come out um, probably like June, July time frame. Nice. Uh, post, post Turkey. So we've got a lot of, I feel bad for those guys editing. Cause there's a, I mean, there's a lot to put goes into that one. Um, you know, multiple years, lots of video footage, lots of encounters. So that one's, that's going to be exciting. That should be coming out. And then the off season stuff. Yeah. We're, we're doing that, um, as we speak filming that, um, and, and certainly there'll be that extra, um, focus put on that one particular deer cool. um, we'll have other ones to go as well that we'll have probably a lot more footage and history with but the fact that there's one of that caliber around um you know that'll be a that'll definitely be worth tracking yeah yeah exciting yeah very cool man well listen we stole a bunch of your time and you know i'm sure you got farming things to to get ramped up and ready for for the next few weeks i'm sure it'll be pretty busy yeah, I see the sprayer coming down the road right now. So we just got done doing burn down on um, all our cover crop. Oh, so, okay. You know, you know, so all that glyphosate, Jared. Yeah, hey, get get out there and get you a whiff. Get you a whiff of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the window's open tonight. Uh, there right you go. The fresh smell. I sleep of naked with the windows open. I hope that's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right, dude. Well, we appreciate it, man. And and as always, thanks for dropping some farming knowledge on us novices. Well, yeah, I, I, I never claim to be a farmer. I tell people I, I grew up not wanting anything to do with it, and here I am. So um, <laughs> it's really, that's the truth. And, uh, you know, these guys joke with me because I can't, I can run the equipment, but don't ask me to fix it. So um, hopefully it helped a little bit. And I appreciate you guys uh, having me on and uh, keep doing that good work. It's fun to listen. Thanks, man. You're welcome anytime. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks, See bro. you guys. See ya. All right, bye. And great. Yeah. yeah. It's a good one. Dropping a little farm on. knowledge because we know nothing. It's good to know about that stuff. I mean, I hope I, yeah, I don't mean to like, it's, it's, it's not at all landowners against the farmers when it comes to that. You know, it's, it's very much a, a, a relationship. And mm-hmm. it's like, but man, it's, it sure seems like it, it would just save everybody a lot of time and effort. And, you know, just, hey, just leave us some here. Let's find a fair number. You know, work with, bet, work, work with your farmer. I it. think on some of them, it was easier back in the day. Like when, when, you know, you had smaller time farmers who were, you know, farming a couple hundred acres, but I think Eric was farming like a couple thousand plus. Right. You know, and so I, just the sheer amount when harvest season comes and it rains imminent, like. It's inconvenient. I yeah. It. It's just, it, and it's probably not even that, like, they don't care as much as, it's just not in their head. Yeah. Like, I mean, they're just going. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, usually they're family operations. So it's like, you know, maybe you talk to the dad and like one of the kids was out cutting and they didn't know. Yeah. And I mean, hell, I don't know anymore. You got these program GPSs. <laughs> like, how are you going to program in to cut, you know, whatever, uh, an acre off? Like, I don't know how that shit works, you know, but. Yeah, I mean, it's it's um, good to hear, at least I, for my part and probably yours, the breakdown on cost there, right? Understanding, okay, yeah, like if, huge. if it's $6 a bushel, right, it's $1,200, you know, an acre Roughly. to potentially, and on yeah. a 200 bushel uh, per acre corn, yeah. you know, and then understanding there's, you know, $600 plus dollars in cost there, 600 to 750 bucks in cost. So it's a substantial amount. And I think even for us or people listening, thinking about planting corn, you know, that is a substantial, it's way easier to go plant, you know, a $50 brassica field than it is a $250 cornfield. I mean, dude, that's so crazy just to do the base, basic math. And it's probably maybe even more than this, but think about a farmer farming, you know, potentially a thousand acres, you know, $600,000, would you cost, cost you to before plant he that. collects a dime uh, before your, I mean, I don't know if that number was including like financed farm equipment or probably not or what, you know, that's your equipment's on top of that. Like what, what's a. What you know? What's a uh, like a, a one combine cost? You know, it's got to be a quarter million, right? At least, yeah. Right? Yep. Hundred fifty, two hundred fifty, three hundred fifty. I bet it's two hundred fifty plus. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, you got substantial equipment. You've got staff because you're not doing it all yourself. Mm-hmm. You've got a lot of cost out. And I mean, think of like when you get rain or tornadoes. Like when you have these crop failures. If that's yeah, what insurance is for. But I mean, I'm I'm assuming insurance breaks them even. Right, like if you've got six hundred thousand dollars in investment, and you lose the crop. 
I'm sure insurance is getting you to 600000 They're not getting you to the 1.2 that you were expected to make. Sure. Which still helps you cover. Yeah, I mean, I guess when you break it down in a business, you know, like your cost to plant the field is essentially like your cost of goods sold if you're selling like mm-hmm. a product. You know, and so to get 600000 back, like, you know, that's, that's as long as that's, an, you know, because that's probably in a, in a farming business, you know, your cost of good is probably way more than your, like your hundred percent margin on a, on a sale, which is great for a product. Right. And so you just need to use that to cover your other expenses, which is overhead equipment payments, mm-hmm. you know, staff. And then at the end of the day, you've got whatever you made for the year. Yeah. R- then, risky business. For and then sure. the government takes a chunk. And then you got freaking Jared over here trying to haggle with me over five acres. Yeah. <laughs> you son of a bitch. I get it. I yeah. Get it. <laughs> That's why they end up shitting in your scrape. Yeah. I run at him quite frequently now. The serial. <laughs> That's shitter. not I don't by know coincidence. Yeah, yeah I it called is. you the other day, and you're like, "You're a like, code on serial shitter up here." Would you believe that they're <laughs> still tearing that scrape up? <laughs> they love it. <laughs> they're like, well, "I don't know what's in this dirt, but this is good." <laughs> he for sure had a high fiber diet. That's all I know. Yeah. So, all right. Well, that'll do it for this episode with Eric Hansen from Just Hunt Club. Appreciate him stopping in and dropping some knowledge and talking New York State. Our, us Northeast guys kind of have to stick together on, on yeah. things. And um, episode 125, right, Nick? Yep. And uh, yeah, we'll see you all next week. Later. It's take me. Oh.